Excellent. Um, good evening and welcome to the Finance Committee's special meeting of Tuesday, June 15th. If the clerk would please call the roll. Yes, of course. Vice Mayor Burt. Here. Chair Cormack. Here. Council Member Philseth. Here. Three present. Excellent. And now we'll move on to oral communications where members of the public may speak to any item under the Finance Committee's jurisdiction uh, that is not on the agenda this evening. And again, on the agenda this evening, we have a lease for the Regional Water Quality Control Plant near there with bioscience properties, and then discussion of local ballot measures and affordable housing funding. And if the clerk could please assist any members of the public who would like to provide comments. Yes, of course. If anyone would like to speak on oral communications, please raise your hand on the Zoom app or press star nine. And Chair Cormack, we have no public speakers. Thank you. And that brings us to our first action item. Uh, would st does staff have a brief presentation? I believe so, since you sent it to us. We do. And good evening, Chair Cormack and Finance Committee, Brad Eggleston, Public Works Director. Director Eggleston, I'm gonna interrupt you for just a minute and say uh, this is probably a lot less exciting than what you've been doing the past two days, but thank you for, <laughs> for appearing. All right. So noted, thank you. Uh, tonight, we're here to discuss leasing space adjacent to the regional water quality control plant uh, that will help facilitate the plant's extensive capital improvement program. And with us tonight are plant manager, Jamie Allen, uh, Acting Assistant Director Karin North, Real Estate Manager Sunny Tong, and I see Management Specialist Phil Bobel has just joined us, and I believe it's Phil who is going to walk us through our brief presentation. So take it away, Phil. Phil, it appears that yeah, you are on mute. If you can please unmute yourself. Did that work? No. Yes, it did. You're good. Okay. So as Rad said, we are going to <clears throat> give you a brief presentation on leasing space immediately adjacent to the water quality control plant to facilitate our capital improvement program, which is ramping up rapidly. Next slide. So the recommendation specifically is <clears throat> that the finance committee review the lease agreement, attachment A to your staff report with bioscience properties. That's the name of the owner of this building, 1900 Embarcadero, for the regional water quality control plant for work, storage, and parking space at 1900 Embarcadero in the amount of 1.73 million for a five-year lease term and recommend to council that the city manager be authorized to execute the agreement. That's our recommendation. Next slide. So our capital improvement program can be depicted in several ways. This is a diagram of the plan, which we did in 2012, so-called long range plan. And <clears throat> A major takeaway from this is that we're rapidly filling up the space at the water quality control plant. Uh, a 24 seven operation requires you build something before you can stop using the old thing. That's one reason we're filling up space. Another is the new refurbished facilities to be uh, safety conscious and to meet modern day <clears throat> environmental requirements are bigger. And thirdly, we got to leave enough space for parking and contractor operations and can't continue to put trailers out there. So the bottom line is we need more space. In the lower left-hand 
corner, you see a red star. That is the location of 1900 Embarcadero. Just to get your bearings, Embarcadero is all the way to the left and you're only seeing a small part of it, of course. And Embarcadero Way is sort of barely visible parallel to the lower edge of the slide. And 1900 is at the intersection of Embarcadero and Embarcadero Way, where the red <coughs> star is. Next slide. So the features that <coughs> we find necessary for this rental space, first, we need room for about 25 people. Uh, we need a couple conference rooms and <clears throat> it needs to be within walking distance of the plant and we'll come back to that. And we need to be able to move people possibly in and out of this building as different projects are done for flexibility. Next slide. So why does it need to be adjacent? Uh, you see four of our groups that we're definitely gonna move into this new space, probably a couple of more as we finalize the planning in the next uh, month. But th these four <clears throat> are shown and the activities are shown that require them to be essentially at the plant. I won't go through them all. Next slide. So why obtain this new space now? The first bullet explains that it will free up three trailers that we have on site that we've had for quite a while. We have some of our own people in there. We need to get them out so that we can devote this space, these trailers, to contractors and consultants. As our CIP warms up here and gets really moving, we're gonna to have to have multiple contractors, multiple consultants on site at one time. The need for additional uh, parking and lay down areas for the CIP projects means that the, we can't take any more of our current open area, which is primarily parking lot area. We can't take any more of that for new, um, new trailers. So we, we gotta use these existing trailers. We need to move people out of the so-called administration building. I call it a so-called administration building because it was never intended to house people. And now we need to get going on our recycle water program, which is what it was originally designed to be for. So we need to get the people out of the administration building into this new lease space so that it can become the hub of the pumping and piping for our expanded recycle water program. Uh, so we've tried to find adjacent space to the plant for some time. I've personally been in touch with uh, landowner, uh, building owners uh, that and there really are just a couple of possibilities and none of them have been opened us until this uh, came along. In five years, we'll know whether we need this space uh, indefinitely or whether we can give it up. So we've got a five year lease to let us plan and cost out alternatives to using this space versus building uh, a large building on site. Uh, Multi-story would be required most likely unless we used uh, this kind of space 
for an extended period of time. So you'll be hearing more about this as we complete the analysis of our options, but we know that we'll need uh, this space for five years. Next slide. So here's some details about the uh, rental agreement. It can start as early as July 1st. If you uh, approve this tonight and council approves it subsequently, then we begin this lease on July 1st. It's five years, as I said before. Uh, we negotiated four months of free rent on top of negotiating a lower rental, monthly rental rate than was originally uh, the asking price. The total lease space is about 5,500 square feet. For those of you that think in terms of square feet, um, per previous slide, that's enough room for about 25 people and their equipment um, on, on that site. So the initial monthly rent, because it does go up over time, is $5.30 per square foot. Um, the, the feature which is hard to capture in a table is that this is a so-called full service lease where the landlord is paying taxes and expenses except to the extent they go up <clears throat> and then the city, the tenant pays the increase. And that is standard for a so-called full service lease. It's capped at 7% of the con additional controllable expenses. The lease may be terminated, and in fact is terminated, if council doesn't appropriate funds in any given year as part of the budget cycle. In other words, this is going to be now part of the budget for the future, but if council does not fund it in any particular year, then after a 90 day period, the lease is terminated. I'll point that out because of the fact that we are paying these additional expenses over time. Next slide. The funding for the lease comes out of the operating budget of the sewage treatment plant. Now, we didn't know that this was going to be doable in time to make it part of the FY22 budget, which you know better than I, is in the throes of getting approved right now. So what we need to do is if you approve it tonight, then the lease approved tonight, then we need to have a budget amendment, which we're prepared to do in front of council, ready to go as they approve the budget in the coming weeks. But the bottom line is it's a operating budget. It supports our capital improvement program, but the lease will be paid for out of our operating budget. Next slide. This just shows um, that, surprise, surprise, this amount, 1.73 million. Um, actually, this is done on an annual basis. So about 300,000 per year uh, is a very small fraction of our annual operating budget. Next slide. So this is our last slide. The recommendation for finance is <clears throat> that you adopt a motion reading as follows, and I'll read it. The finance committee recommends that the city council approve and authorize the city manager to execute a lease agreement 
the attachment with bioscience properties for the regional air quality control plant, work, storage, and parking space at 1900 Embarcadero Road. In the recommended amount of 1.73 million for the five year lease term. That concludes our presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Bogle. It feels like uh, quite recently we were just congratulating you on retirement, but we heard you were going to come back to help. So it's delightful to see you again. Um, you. With, with that, we'll go to members of the public who would like to provide comment on this action item number one. Yes, if anyone from the public would like to speak on this, please raise your hand on the Zoom app or press star nine. And Chair Cormac, we have no public speakers. Thank you so much. And now I'll turn to my colleagues. Who would like to go first? Looks like Council Member Philseth was faster on the draw. <laughs> looks, uh, looks pretty thorough. Um, if, uh, if for some reason uh, the council decides not to appropriate funding in year three or four or something like that, uh, I gather there's no termination penalty or anything like that. That, that's right. The non-appropriation clause of the lease uh, means it could be terminated without penalty. And are there, if we choose to renew in five years, are there any constraints on that, or can, is there an option to renew it to existing terms? I didn't say anything like that here, but uh, or is, is it a new negotiation? Uh, Phil or Sunny, do you want to speak to that? The option to renew. Sure. Yeah, this is Sunny Tall with the Real Estate Division. Yeah, we have an option to renew it under the same terms, yeah. but the mark the, the rent will be adjusted to a percentage of market. And uh, looks like we got a good rate because we want it real bad. <laughs> Brad's laughing. Okay. Um, yeah. And the alternative, if we if the alternative uh, would be so we don't foresee not needing this space anymore in the future. Your alternative would be to to. Uh, add improvements to the existing uh, area in the long term. That's right. And the, the committee may remember that when, a couple months ago when we went over the five-year CIP, uh, yep. we ha have a very pretty uh, substantial CIP project for a new operations and laboratory building. Ah. Uh, as originally scoped, that building would include these spaces. And I, I think part of what we talked about in the staff report is that as we got into some initial design work on that, it was very, very expensive uh, to the point where we're now trying to rethink, are there some other strategies to make that building smaller? And mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this in the long term might, might support that. But that's what Phil was referring to, that there's more work, work we'll be doing uh, over the coming years. Okay, all right, thanks. Vice Mayor Burt. Yeah, um, so Mr. Tong, can you go over again the, um, uh, the conditions of the potential renewal after five years? Sure, yeah. So the city has an option to extend the term for an additional five years at 95% of the then prevailing market rate, uh, but otherwise the terms will be the same as it is uh, under the initial term. And that prevailing market rate, um, that goes into, ties into my next question, which is how, how do we define that and how does this uh, this initial um, rate compare in a market that's kind of in such flux right now with abnormal vacancies? Um, I don't know if you're looking at the sub market of uh, the area in the East Embarcadero out there or citywide or what? Yeah, so I think your first question was about how, how do we determine the market rate at the uh, renewal time uh, five years from now? And that is through um, just talking with the landlord. And if we can't come to some sort of an agreement, uh, there's a provision for an, uh, engaging an appraiser to help determine the market rent. Um, as to the how the rent now compares to market, uh, the city commissioned an appraisal report and uh, the appraiser determined that the market rent was 475 a square foot, uh, but that doesn't take into account any concessions uh, this lease comes, as Phil mentioned, that there are concessions in place 
uh, namely the four months of free rent. So when you factor that in, it's uh, essentially an equivalent of a starting rent of about 495 a square foot. So we're still slightly above market, but uh, it's 475 compared to 495 if you factor in the concessions. Well, are we assuming though that those other, that, uh, that average of 475 does not include any concessions? Correct. Is that something that we know is the case? Yeah, that's what the appraiser determined. Okay, it's without concessions is the 475. It's most, yeah. huh, interesting, because most tenants get some degree of concessions in TIs or otherwise. Uh, okay, uh, well, the, the location is certainly um, uh, ideal for the purposes we have, and, and uh, I know that the need is there, so um, uh, I think it's reasonable to go forward um, you know, if you guys were having to be separated from that facility by even a short distance, it, it operationally creates big issues. So very good. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, first of all, this temporary space is much nicer than Coverly, which is where we've been sending staffers for like, you know, multiple times. So uh, that's, that's positive. Um, and appreciate the explanation of the portables, you know, the school district of sort, you know, that's the standard way of doing things. But at a certain point, you know, you need, you need a, a little bit of extra space. Um, I, I agree with council member Phil said, this was a very thorough staff report. Um, the explanation of why the staff needs to be so close to the location is, um, seems like it should have been self-evident and yet I'm glad you went through it. Um, thank you for explaining the, um, the months of free rent and for getting that in there. Um, I'm glad this has already been checked with the partners. We hadn't talked about that yet, but obviously, um, you know, this is, uh, we're, we're one of five in this group. So, and then um, with the budget amendment, um, does this change what we think the rate should be for the next fiscal year, or are we just adjusting things within the reserves? I believe just adjusting within reserves. We're not proposing any changes to rates as a result. Okay. Well, that concludes my questions. And unless either of my colleagues is anxious to continue this, I will go ahead and make the staff recommendation. Second. Oh, there you go. I had two seconds. I think I think the vice mayor was first. Um, so the only thing I'd like to say in speaking to my motion is, yes, uh, Director Eggleston, I recall that. And as, as you know, I'm a bit of a worrier. So I remember being worried, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna manage all these big projects? So um, obviously staff was already working on it. And so um, again, it is an unusual time and we may be paying a very minor premium for the location, but I think it's necessary in this instance. Vice Mayor Burt. Um, I did, I was not raising my hand. You just asking for the vote or? No, yeah, I was just asking if you wanted to speak to your second. No, no. All right, we'll go ahead and proceed with the vote then. I will vote yes. Oh, sorry, Vice Mayor Burt? Yes. And I will vote yes. And Council Member Philseth? Yes. That passes unanimously on a 3-0 vote. Thank you all for being here and we'll let you get back to the important work that uh, Public Works does. Thank you. Um, and now we move to the work plan for pursuit of a revenue generating local ballot measure and potential guidance on affordable housing. And who will be doing the presentation? Ms. Nose, over to you. I think uh, City Manager Shikata is actually going to kick us sure, off. I'll kick us off. And then am I handing it to Kylie or Steve? Just, okay, Ms. Nose, you're correct. Okay, well, <laughs> just, just to kick us off and, and for the purpose of uh, putting tonight's discussion in some context, um, wanted to note for the committee uh, that you have in your packet for next Monday's council meeting, an informational report that will be our second progress report on the community and economic recovery strategy. So we're, we're doing this now as a monthly uh, update uh, with, uh, you'll notice the traffic signal, green light, yellow light, red light, uh, indications of progress being made on the 
numerous items that are part of that work plan. The development of ballot measures is one of the elements on that work plan. And uh, so as we're uh, going about the the day-to-day -day business or week-to-week -week business of uh, the reports we bring to the city council, we are organizationally really increasing our focus and maintaining our focus on those key elements that are part of the recovery strategy. So again, just wanted to flag that this is one of them. It is a somewhat uh, unique uh, element in that it, it arguably represents something of the tension when we talk about community and economic recovery, in that it is a topic that will enable us uh, to uh, develop the resources needed to uh, support uh, the services and infrastructure uh, that are prioritized uh, by our community as a part of a multi-year uh, fiscal sustainability strategy. While at the same time, the other part of the tension is recognizing to the extent that we're talking about uh, elements such as business tax or any tax in general, the need to be uh, mindful of the impact on taxpayers. So uh, just set that as some context so that it's clear for the community, committee and the community that we are looking at it within that context. Uh, so uh, as we start off the discussion, we'll bring you up to date on where uh, the discussion left off previously and uh, talk about the work plan uh, for how we can anticipate addressing the issues uh, that will be relevant for your decision making over the next several months. So with that, we will turn it over to Ms. Nose. All right. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, as you mentioned, this is a much larger uh, item as part of the community part of much larger community and economic work plan. Um, and I am essentially here tonight as Steve's proxy, uh, who's behind the scenes helping us run the PowerPoint, and frankly was the one who really helped on a staff perspective us with last ballot um, business tax analysis and work. Um, so <clears throat> just want to recognize him, even though he's uh, on the back end doing technical stuff to make uh, as we make it through here. So tonight, as you see on the screen, uh, is a recommendation for the finance committee uh, to recommend to for staff to return to council, um, basically to uh, start or rather be the impetus for uh, staff to resume work essentially on um, pursuit of either a business tax or another ballot measure as the, the committee so chooses. Um, this is, uh, I feel like I'm on Groundhog's Day two years later. Uh, this is <laughs> I think it was June, uh, two years prior to this time. Um, and COVID years are just really totally messing with my sense of time. Um, we had this preliminary conversation and is the kickoff with the committee on all the ways and kind of restarting the conversation on ways to assess taxes or raise revenues in local government um, and narrowing the field. So we're right back at that precipice, that start of the process. Um, and as we move through, we'll go through the work plan as later um, in this presentation. And you'll see, it will be a funneling. Um, so know and feel comfortable as a committee and ultimately we'll reiterate this to the council that this is step one of many steps that we will be taking together. Um, and ultimately the goal as staff moves through this is to slowly narrow that funnel. Um, with the committee and with the council as we move towards a 2022 ballot measure um, or potentially move towards a 2022 ballot measure. Um, over the last year, we've also included, uh, we've heard a lot from the committee and council, a number of interests that are related to revenue generating ballot measures that may be new um, or more emerging than they were when we previously had this discussion. So staff have included some of that and wrapped that into this presentation uh, just to really update ourselves, not just where we left off, but uh, what has happened over the, the past 15 to 18 months or so. Um, so as we move through this, uh, we are, we will have, or rather we're expecting to have um, this conversation with the finance committee before moving to the full council for formal direction. Um, and ultimately, again, looking at pursuit of a business tax uh, discussion and potentially direction for pursuit of a um, on-bill tax or on-bill charge for gas and electric services. We'll talk about that a little bit further in this presentation. Um, really looking at direction to proceed with refining some revenue estimates on specific uh, tax measures that the committee and our council are interested in pursuing. And uh, lastly, an important component that's new this time is staff has rolled in a referral uh, as part of the housing work plan that council had provided, which was to look at affordable housing funding options. Um, and so as 
taxes or potentially ballot measures are one of those strategies. Staff has rolled that referral up into this report as another item for additional information um, and to, to begin those discussions. So on the next slide, uh, hopefully this table is very familiar to the committee, uh, but ultimately this is a summary of our major tax revenues in the city's general fund. As a reminder to the public, and I know this committee is well versed in it, the general fund is where all of our general services are funded from. That's our police, our fire, our community services, our library services, um, and the like. And so it's through these general fund revenues that the city is able to offer these services to the community. Um, and obviously these are taxes assessed on the broader um, ecosystem of the Palo Alto community, visitors, um, businesses, and residents alike. Obviously, we've all talked about this recently, that we've seen a significant decline since 2019 in our tax revenues. Um, and given the continued uncertainty and the, uh, frankly, right now, persistent sensitivity of revenues like TOT, uh, it behooves us as an organization to potentially look at other ballot measures. Um, and so moving on to the next slide, we can look at the different ways that uh, the city can generate uh, additional revenues. <clears throat> So there is a lot more information in the staff report and uh, for the committee and community's awareness. Staff has attached a lot in the attachments of the staff report. And that's really for those who may not have been following the conversation previously or uh, need to come back up to speed on where we left off. Um, so lots of good information uh, in those attachments to kind of bring everybody to the same plane as we start to move forward. And one of the attachments really looks at all the different ways that the city can generate revenue. At a very high level, um, if we're looking at a local ballot measure, a uh, general tax is one option, and a general tax is something that needs to be approved by a simple majority of voters, so 50% plus one, um, and would be put on a general election. A general election for the city is on even years, so that's why 2022 would be the next opportunity for a general tax for this organization. Uh, a special tax requires a two thirds or super majority of voters and is dedicated for a certain purpose. Um, it must be per, uh, put before voters at some regular general election, though there are some exceptions to that. Um, and note that parcel taxes do require the same um, level of vote authority of two thirds super majority. Uh, different types of taxes that can appear before the voters are parcel taxes. Uh, so parcel taxes are things that are assessed on land or an asset um, and may be structured in different ways. Sales taxes uh, are on purchases, sales and use taxes, uh, and there are limits um, on how much a city is able to raise their local portion of the sales tax rate. Uh, currently in Palo Alto, uh, we're a little bit above nine. I think at this point when we include all of the county measures. Uh, business taxes, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about. The city of Palo Alto does not have a business tax at present. Uh, TOT, also called hotel taxes, and utility user taxes. Utility user taxes are um, taxes on things like water um, and uh, telephone <clears throat> utilities. So all of these are different um, types of measures or taxes that a city can levy. Um, through a voter approval. And so we'll continue on and move into a little bit more detailed discussion on business taxes, which is ultimately where the council and the committee had decided previously um, to focus staff's attention and the organization's thought on the next ballot. Before we do that though, just one um, level setting, again, framework to think about a tax as we move forward. Um, and we brought this forward during our last conversation, and I think it really helped the committee as well as the council keep a full view as we're looking at how, what kind of tax to assess, how to construct that tax. Um, and it was actually recommended to us by one of our consultants, uh, and it's an ease framework. So when you're looking at a measure, ease stands for equity. So who is the tax impacting um, and how is it felt across businesses, residents, and industry? A for administrability. So how, how hard is it to administer the tax? Oftentimes, if a tax is too complex, uh, the benefit, frankly, of the tax can be wiped out by the cost to administer it if it's overly complex or staff um, heavy. 
stability. So really, what are the drivers of the tax and how the revenue is generated? A good example is TOT um, as in hotel tax, as we've seen. Uh, that is a very volatile revenue source. Um, and it has been very stable for us in the past and as an organization for the most part, uh, but with the pandemic and the sheltering in place order has had a significant impact. Um, so really looking at what are the drivers behind what will generate that revenue and how stable it may or may not be. And then lastly is economic benefits. So is the tax efficient? How does it pair with economic de um, development priorities? or disruptions, frankly, to the taxpayer um, that may change how, how someone does business. Okay, so with that framework in mind and staff will continue to use that framework as we move through these processes with the committee and um, the council, just again, to keep that full lens of how a tax could work or looks like. So specifically, um, we delved in deep on a business tax uh, or potentially a business tax measure uh, aiming for what was going to be the 20 uh, measure on the 2022 general election. And that previous work had uh, free primary tenants, essentially, from a resource perspective, as well as a process perspective. There was the research analysis and modeling aspect, which staff um, and the committee and council have approved an outside consultant to assist us with that. Um, the next kind of track is stakeholder outreach. So this is stakeholders across the community. Again, those that the tax would be levied on all the way to residents. Um, and that city, the city had contracted with TPWB, a firm, to assist us with that outreach. Um, the third tenant is polling. So this is not just survey polling, uh, statistic, you know, survey monkey or whatnot. This is actually statistically um, sound polling that we have a pollster come in um, and test how uh, the electorate would perceive different types of measures, structures, language, et cetera. And for that, we uh, had a contract with FM3 uh, at the time. The fourth tenant, not on here, but uh, as we progress, uh, and if we get there and choose to as a body get there, uh, is actually legal support. Um, and that would be the legal support necessary to actually draft the ordinance or the ballot measure language itself. Um, and so that would be a fourth kind of resource that staff would need as we move through this process uh, in order to actually get to the ballot. Um, for business tax, there are different mechanisms or units of measure uh, to assess that tax on. And specifically, staff have listed out four that we had previously looked at and the committee and council had chosen to narrow to employee headcount. Obviously, things have changed significantly since that activity. Um, so one major aspect is, is if it is still the will of the committee and the council that we pursue a business tax for 2022, uh, identifying that unit of measure early uh, is very critical because uh, uh, there are different levels and degrees of information, frankly, that are available in order for staff to do the analysis. Um, and the more variables there are, the longer it'll take. And so just uh, bear in mind, and it, frankly, the additional resources it will take. Um, so bear in mind those aspects as we move through this process. And again, this gets back to the idea of funneling as we move through this process. Um, so the last piece on this uh, slide, sorry, Steve, is just as a reminder to this committee and the public, we have not funded nor resourced this initiative. Uh, we mentioned that in the work plan as part of the community and economic recovery item and just wanted to make that crystal clear here and as part of the um, staff report we've identified that. However, uh, as we've outlined the consulting resources that we typically use uh, in prior years on this um, and as part of your budget deliberations, I'm sure you recall there's a re reserve as part of the 2022 uh, proposed budget for strategic investments that's currently recommended for a balance of 750,000 in 2022. And that reserve was specifically set there for initiatives like this one that we knew the council had on work plans, but we hadn't yet refined the scope enough to know what the funding allocation should be. So staff would recommend that the council uh, tap that reserve in order to fund the initiative uh, that they wish to pursue. So assuming that we organize around these paths and the resources are there, um, the next slide is going over, um, frankly, what are we going to use the money for? So uh, we've talked a lot about different ways to raise additional revenues. Um, and we have talked about 
uh, uses of those revenues in a number of settings. So staff just tried to do our best to kind of synthesize it down into four concrete areas or core themes that we've heard. Um, obviously, affordable housing funding uh, is one area that we've heard a desire for additional um, resources. Electrification and climate change and the climate adaptation resilience, the SCAP plan, uh, is another major priority that has been identified and is also unfunded. Um, capital needs. And this is could be a number of different areas, but we've talked about we've slimmed down on our capital budget, but also we have some major capital upgrades coming like grade separation, which was one of the impetuses for the other uh, business tax. And lastly, uh, we've talked about we have a core service and financial gap essentially that we're currently projected even as we recover through this pandemic. Um, and so really making sure that we're able to provide the really cherished uh, services of the community and continue to do so, I think is another aspect of this. And part of that obviously can be dealing with some of the um, utilities transfer that we've talked about as well, ensuring that uh, revenue stream up or sub uh, substituting for it. So the council's part of the housing work plan asked staff to come back with various funding options for affordable housing. and excuse me, uh, the city really has a number of different options to fund affordable housing. Um, and ultimately, at least in some of our conversations, especially um, we had some conversations with our financial advisors, typically projects have uh, a strategy. It's not one silver bullet in order to fund a project or to solve the affordable housing funding needs. It's an amalgamation of multiple things. Um, so here's just a quick highlight excuse me, there's additional information in the attachment of the staff report, but obviously the city could raise general taxes as we've talked about. Uh, there's inclusionary housing requirement fees uh, that could be done, commercial linkage fees uh, that can be also assessed, uh, the jobs housing linkage policy. Uh, it's a fee similar to the commercial linkage fee, uh, but identifies the nexus between commercial development and housing demand. And so then that fee goes to support the development of housing to meet the demand created by that commercial development. Um, <clears throat> there's an infrastructure finance district that could be created and established. Um, it's called a EIFD, Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District, and it provides broad authority basically for local agencies to use tax increment to finance um, a wide variety of projects. Obviously, there's bond measures or bond financing. This is the financing mechanism that the city uh, did to fund the library. Uh, so just as a reminder on that. And there are also other area, other ways to do it. And one that we've listed out here is Cal CHA or the California Community Housing Agency. And it's the state's first public agency that's focused exclusively on the production, preservation and protection of middle income housing. And so what this is, is a JPA issues revenue bonds for specific projects. Um, and so the revenue bonds are project specific bonds that are used to fund the project uh, and service any debt obligations. And ultimately, in order to do this, um, the city joins a JPA um, and then to be active within the boundaries of a, of a local jurisdiction, the jurisdiction will join that JPA via a resolution. And typically what happens is it's on, you know, city property um, or it's on a piece of property that this uh, JPA or this authority purchases, finances the debt, and then there are terms at the end of that debt for the city to acquire um, that property. So rather complex, but that's typical with housing, affordable housing funding, uh, but another newer option uh, that the committee could consider. Okay, so what's the path forward? So staff have kind of outlined the work plan, which is ultimately what the committee is here to approve tonight. Um, I recommend to the city council for approval. Uh, the first slide is what do we, what does the next six months look like? So from today through December 30th of 2021 calendar year, what, what does it look like? What are the steps? And Overall, uh, the thought process is the governance structure would be the same as prior engagements, that the finance committee would be the body to offer initial feedback um, and then really proceed to the city council for the full direction and authorization 
uh, again, a, a process that we used previously and I think relatively worked well. It allowed the committee to have more in-depth conversations and the council to then benefit from those in-depth conversations to uh, ensure that the strategic direction uh, was in alignment with the majority of the council. Also, may, so major milestones we've outlined here essentially between the council and the committee in terms of their bodies, but obviously there's a lot of work that's going to happen in between each of these milestones and these decision points. So for example, just over the summer, this summer, so the next six weeks, essentially, staff would need to be working to develop agreements for consulting services, which may require an RFP or authorization from the Council on Sole Source Exemption. Um, depending on how far this committee may recommend to the Council to narrow on the ballot measures, um, staff will seek consultant expertise to help with that modeling uh, analysis and research. And so, for example, in the fall, uh, staff will then take the finance or not finance, the city council's authorization. So if you look on the timeline, it says August, we'll bring this back. The full council would authorize staff in August to do the initial preliminary revenue estimates, uh, which staff would bring back then to the committee for their review adjustments uh, and synthesis for the full council. So as you can kind of see, we start with initial preliminary work in the uh, June, July, August, September timeframe. And then we move into the more substantial refinement in the October, November with an ultimate um, kind of path forward decided by December. Um, and by path forward, I mean, what's the uh, tax instrument that we may or may not be looking at or tax instruments? Uh, what are the units of measure that we would want to use in order to assess that tax? Um, and what are some of the general frames, meaning local, uh, I'm sorry, not local, small business was an example of where we left the conversation off last. Um, how do we want to define small business? Because these different characteristics of a measure will all impact how much revenue it can generate. Um, and so really refining those down by December will be critical so that on the next slide, we can look at the following six months, which start in January, which will then be the iterations of um, actually crafting the language of the measure, reviewing that language with the full council, uh, doing a refined round of polling that's going to actually test the ballot language um, for the committees and councils review as we march towards what is required as a June 2022 authorization from this council. Uh, so a year from now, basically, uh, to place a measure or measures on the November 2022 ballot. So as you can see in this work plan, a lot of steps, uh, a very iterative process, again, adapting through um, the different kind of machinations, the different additional data, the refinement as we move through it, but ultimately moving towards a decision a year from now on what measures would be placed on the ballot, what the language would be for each of those, um, and everyone's role as we move towards and march towards those dates. So a lot of information, um, but just to recap, uh, really, again, many steps ahead of us, but tonight, the focus for this committee tonight at the very least is to affirm that this work plan uh, for the pursuit of a potential November 2022 ballot measure or measures, I should say, uh, and recommend to council the approval of that work plan. And if the committee is in agreement or able to, great in terms of additional guidance on of affirmation of pursuit of the business tax, uh, refinement of that tax measure, if the committee already has opinions on that, um, affirming pursuit of a utility use based tax. Again, this is to deal with the city's current charges on um, measure or charges on uh, utility bills and then proceeding with direction to continue those refinements. Um, and so I will actually ask our attorney Molly Stump to help up weigh in since she's been integral in working on all of this and will be heavily involved as we move forward. Thank you, Kylie and Ed and um, good evening, uh, committee members. I'm happy to assist with this really important pro uh, process. For now, just two quick refinements. 
Um, one is that um, uh, a special tax, a business tax that's structured as a special tax can actually be placed on any election. It's not restricted to a general municipal election. The second piece is that uh, parcel tax is always requires that super majority of two thirds, but it could be structured as either a general tax or a special tax, depending on what it's spent for and what the legal rules are for, for that spending. So ha happy to review the rules as we go through. They're complicated and it's hard to remember them all. So we'll, I'm here to help. Okay, I think that's it, Chair Cormac. Thank you, Director Nose, for refreshing our memory. Um, I'm not sure I've ever seen so many links at the end of a, of a staff report. All right, with that, we will go to the public and see if anyone would like to provide comments on this agenda item. Yes, if anyone will raise your hand on the Zoom app or press star nine. And Chair Cormac, we have no public speakers. Thank you very much to the clerk. All right. Um, I think we'll probably uh, take a few rounds here <laughs> um, since there's so, uh, so many topics. Which of my colleagues would like to go first? Councilmember Phil Seth. Sure, I got a whole bunch. There's a, a lot of ground to cover. Thank you very much to Steph on this. Um, let's see, let me start with um, the sort of the gas, uh, the gas transfer issue. Um, if we go back and uh, do a ballot measure to uh, restore the equity transfer um, or to get voter approval to do that again, uh, uh, what are the limits on how much that can be? Is that still subject to uh, uh, proposition, I guess, 26 uh, guidelines, or, you know, can we treat it more generally as a carbon tax? We, so um, with a small caveat that creative plaintiff's lawyers may decide to make a variety of challenges and have done so in this area of the law, which is complex and continuing to develop, we believe that um, Essentially, these are policy decisions that council makes in terms of what to put before the voters and with voter approval, it is a voter approved tax and that is an exception to the, what is otherwise the requirements of Prop 26 that that um, revenues be uh, justified by cost basis and then spent on the utility. So in other words, right. voter approval should um, provide for a basis to do all kinds of things uh, with a lot of flexibility. Okay, that's helpful. So given that the long-term gap uh, looks like steady state of roughly $4 million a year, if I understand what you just said is that we're not tied to that. It could be $2 million a year, we could try to raise $2 million a year, we could try to raise $6 million a year, um, you know, or some other number. Do I understand that? I think that's, I think that's what you said. Is that, did I yes, get that right? Yes, correct. Okay, cool. Um, let me ask a question about, which is sort of in the same vein, which is the utility user tax. Um, I gather the utility user tax is also not subject to Prop 26. It's, a, it's sort of a different beast altogether. And so it can be whatever we want, we want or the voters want. That's correct. It can be whatever the, what, what the voters approve. Can, so, can really different utility, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, can gas and gas and uh, electricity and other things be independent of one another or do we need sort of a one uh, a one bucket one? You do not. And and right now, the way our t uh, tax is structured, there's, I believe there's one for gas, one for electric, one for water, and one for telephone. telephone. Did I miss one? Was there, is there a wastewater? No. I don't think so. You could, you could touch the rate on any or all of those. And we do have two rates um, right now. I would need to check who has which rate uh, or what utility has which rate, but one is, uh, I believe, 5% and the other one, I believe, is like 4.75 or something. It's, like the, telephone. it's the telephone. Yeah, user the phone is different from the others. Correct. It, the I think it's, yeah, user that, user. that's what I saw in the staff report too. Right. right. So I think, I think you guys are. The language guys are all, was updated a few years ago and the rate was reduced at that time. So, you know. If we decide that uh, 
you know, we're going to take this opportunity to uh, to weave in a climate component uh, into this. We could do that both through a, a gas equity transfer and a utility user uh, utility user uh, approach. Is, is what I think I'm hearing. If we were to decide to do that. Yes. So essentially, um, a what we've been thinking about is a fix for the legal issue identified by the superior court with respect to the gas transfer. Yep. That fix, voter approved fix, is really a form of utility user tax. So council yep. could handle that if you wanted to mirror or match the status quo by adjusting the rate of the existing gas tax, or you could call it out as a separate line a sort of maintain the status quo of general support of city services line on the utility bill. Legally, they're the same. They have a different look and feel to um, to, to the pair. Okay. Let me shift gears and ask one about uh, affordable housing. Uh, section. <clears throat> if I understood the JPA model, uh, basically there's this agency, uh, California, re relatively recent agency, California Community Housing Association. Uh, if we worked with them, it would be a mechanism where they would purchase, they or a JPA using them, would purchase uh, properties and deed restricted uh, uh, around income. It's, it, it's, it, it, I think that's what I heard you say. Um, is there any facility for such an entity uh, not to actually buy property, but to act, act, but to buy deed restriction on an existing property without actually buying the property? Go to a market rate project and say, for this much money, sell us this many units deed restricted to such and such an income level. Is there, is there any facility for them, or actually, in fact, any other agency uh, to do that? Uh, Council Member Phil said this is Rachel Tanner, Assistant Director of Plan Development Services. I'm Hi. not aware of that uh, practice. It uh, doesn't mean no one's doing it, but it's not, not something that I'm aware of occurring. Okay. In principle, that would require less capital, less capital be tied up in, uh, in fixed assets. Um, I think the closest would be something that's not really akin to what you're saying, which is more kind of a voucher based programs that are for the individuals to be able to pay the market rate rent of that right. unit, even though their income may not be high enough. So that's probably more how um, county and state and federal agencies provide that type of voucher um, that then is dispersed across, you know, whatever area that person's eligible to, to rent in. That's an interesting thought. Mm. Yeah, that, that, I, what uh, I heard you describe is maybe um, I'd analogize to a conservation easement. Yeah, that's a good that's a good analogy. Yeah, uh, a limit, yeah. A, a time time horizon, of course. But yes, you know, fifty years. Look, or something. Yeah, we'd have to look into it more. But it it's at first blush, it sounds like it should be doable. And I'm guessing there are some creative folks out there who are already set up mechanisms to do it. Right. Then you wouldn't. I mean. I don't know whether it's good or bad, but you wouldn't be subject to fluctuation of, of market rate rents like you would with a voucher program, which is, to, although, although a voucher thing is a creative approach to, to would be to do that. Okay. Um, do I have more time or should I give Pat some time and then come back to all my questions on business tax? Um, let's, let's rotate around. Okay. Um, and it looks like Mr. Guagliardo, did you want to say something? Oh, were you the, were you the five minute timer? Ah. Okay. Ah. He's going to help us out with the five minutes today. Wonderful. Yeah. I, I, there is an awful lot here and I, you know, I, I think the three of us probably have a lot of, of questions. So um, we'll, we'll just take all the time we need. Man, man, Steve's working everything here. <laughs> okay. Nice thank you. Uh, great. Uh, so just first following up on the perspective utility tax, um, can you refresh me? I thought we were only looking to backfill the loss from gas, uh, but the staff report refers to gas and electric. So that could be a choice essentially of the council in bringing something forward. 
Um, so obviously we could do anything from just shoring up the piece that's in question um, or shoring up the full transfer in full. Because obviously the backfill, we, the, the backfill need is what I was just referring to mm -hmm. there, the loss that we had. That's only in gas, correct? That's only in gas, but remember that that's based on the projected revenue on the electric utility, um, the non-rate revenue outpacing. Um, and so there's just nuances, uh, and Molly's going to come help me out, but there are nuances in the resolution of this current pending litigation. And so one option the, the council could choose is to shore up all aspects of the transfer so that um, if there were challenges in the future that not just the um, current component in question is shored up, but rather the full um, transfer is shored up through a, or rather more bolstered through a voter initiative. So hopefully, Molly, what we're talking about is, is do we cure just the immediate loss or the full structure? And I think that's a policy call. Yeah, I agree. It, that's, it's a question of whether you want their to be the certainty of a, a voter approval or you're more interested in being targeted and willing to accept that there could be some further developments in the law or in this case specifically, because we are just at the superior court level at this point. Yeah, so just for clarification for the staff report going forward to the council and the public, it, on page three at the bottom, it, it says that the, uh, the court upheld uh, or uh, held that a uh, portion of our longstanding transfer of funds from the gas and electric utilities um, could not be lawfully continued. And uh, I, it just, if that needs to be clarified. It does, um, yeah, that's an overstatement of the current uh, holding. The court, the court approved the, the city's transfer from the electric utility. And that's what I thought, yeah. Yep, um, we can make that. Okay, and then um, uh, I, I would be interested as we go forward in the polling being uh, looking at on the utility side, um, whether the electorate would be receptive to that's where we link our climate action initiative is on that tax rather than on um, uh, the business tax per se. Um, I think that there's a, a logical nexus there for the voters, but you'd have to ask them. Um, and you know, if we, we'd have really two arguments we'd be making. One is, can we backfill these losses so that we can uh, re, uh, return services that had to be cut? Uh, and the other is, uh, are you willing to pay to uh, address climate change? And individually, I think they'd both um, um, probably score fairly well. Uh, uh, and this would be a simple majority, is that right? on the it, de it depends on how you structure the expenditure side so if you tell the voters it's for general city services such as and list a few of them that's a general tax it's a simple yeah. majority. so it's still the same requirements as general tax yeah. mm -hmm. um okay well that that'll be interesting and as you know we've seen that in most polls we we get um a higher percentage of the electorate that supports uh, special taxes, but uh, it, it often comes in initially at below the two-thirds threshold, whereas the uh, the uh, general taxes come in with uh, uh, maybe in the upper 50s support, uh, but only need a simple majority. And so that's the dilemma we'll be facing in all likelihood. Something in that ballpark could be interesting how the uh, electorate sentiments change. On the one hand, I, I think that the, the electorate's been moving towards support of a business tax, um, and it'll be somewhat dependent on the status of the economic recovery. Um, in 2009, that tax was going forward, and then we had the Great Recession. The need was greater, and it plowed forward, uh, but the, the voter receptivity to taxes at all on anybody was, was real low at the time. Um, so I... I did want to um, then switch gears a bit to the um, to what we'll call the business tax. Uh, throughout the reports and and last um, the last go round that the council took at this, um, it didn't look at parcel taxes on commercial buildings as a form of a business tax, and I think that's very important that we do so. 
That's exactly what East Palo Alto did. And that's basically was viewed as a business tax. And it is the strongest business tax in the kind of Silicon Valley area. Um, it's uh, it's two dollars and fifty cents a square foot per year, or about twenty cents a month, uh, on offices. Uh, they they chose to they were focusing on their biggest offices, so it's I think over uh, twenty five thousand square foot buildings. Uh, but that equates to about uh, if we assume say two hundred and fifty square feet per employee, uh, then that's about six hundred and twenty five dollars per year per employee. And we don't know, it depends on where we might draw our lines um, on uh, which type of, um, of, uh, of commercial building is taxed at what rate, because you know, we, could, we could say hypothetically say that full rate is uh, building over 10,000 square feet, a smaller yet, or a discounted amount from that, uh, who we exempt, exempting retailers. Um, and uh, one of the things too about the parcel tax, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it can apply to major nonprofits like uh, uh, Stanford Hospital. Is that correct? So I'm not sure specifically about Stanford Hospital. Uh, I do know that the tax structure for a parcel um, has obviously different legal regulations than a business tax. Well, I so mean, nonprofits in general, I think, are not necessarily exempt from the parcel tax. We would need to go look up those I, rules. I, I think that's right, but I we should think. confirm that. Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Um, and, you know, as I was looking at the um, uh, table that we had on um, yeah, where we, it broke down the percentage of our workforce that's in different uh, areas. I was surprised that it only showed healthcare at 11%. Um, so those, uh, assuming that's correct, um, having a tax that would still exempt uh, the big so-called nonprofits. I mean, we have um, uh, Sutter is a nonprofit and Stanford Hospital is a nonprofit technically, and these are points of contention uh, in, in our whole tax system, but nevertheless, that's the way they stand legally. Um, uh, I was concerned that uh, removing them from uh, the, the tax would have a more significant impact than it might uh, according to these percentages. Um, well, one thing on table one of page three, it, it has the, um, what was the, uh, on our, current revenues, it has what was the projected revenue before we've since revised them. And I think as we go forward, we should just uh, update it with most current numbers so that we're all just calibrating against that. I don't think it's super critical for this purpose. Um, and, and Vice Mayor, yeah. um, just one thing, and I know I'm impeding because we're well past our five minutes. Thanks, Steve. Um, just on table A2, um, so attachment A, page six, staff has provided what a $1 per square foot parcel tax would look like um, based on property type. So, uh, and we did it in a $1 metric, not for anything other than uh, an easy variable to scale. So you can- Say again where that is, because I glossed over it. Sure, it's attachment A, page six. It's table A-2. Um, and got so it. that, yeah. perfect. And so you can see that if we assessed on all, and $1 parcel tax on all uh, square feet, that would be about a $25 million, $26 million tax. Um, obviously that has no refinement in there or really looking at um, kind of the details, but just from a cursory look, that is where we are at. And so specifically, if we were looking at office, um, office square footage yeah. is called out as well. Or uh, put differently, about eight cents a square foot per month. So, um, eight cents a square foot. Yeah, oh, I see. You're taking the dollar and dividing it by the yeah, 12. yeah. Okay. And most, you know, when when folks look at their leases, they they typically are looking at their monthly rate. So that's a metric that we'll want to probably include just as to help people calibrate it in their own minds. And then is that where you're calibrating the EPA number that you had just quoted? Yeah, yeah. So they're $2.50 a square foot per year. 
uh, or just over 20 cents a square foot per month. Um, and uh, I'll just leave with uh, one other uh, comment, which is that in the analysis that the consultants did, um, they tended to pick one business related tax per city, uh, but cities like San Francisco, I think have four different business taxes. Um, and East Palo Alto, when you count this parcel tax, they have two um, and that I'm aware of. Um, and so I think we're going to want to look at the business taxes in aggregate. And we had this, what I thought was a, a, a not best metric of revenue per full-time equivalent city employee. Uh, I don't know particularly why that's very relevant. I think what's much more relevant is revenue per worker in the city or revenue per impacted worker by the tax. Uh, and perhaps both of those are important metrics. Um, but um, when, when we're looking at how heavily we tax a business, how do we translate that into comparison to other cities um, and uh, the impacts on the business and whether it would be a substantial impact on their well-being or not? So uh, I'll leave it uh, there for a moment. Thanks to staff for um, getting us started. Um, I particularly appreciated the point, um, Director Nose, when you were talking about the needs. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, take a moment and share my screen, if I may. Let's see. Yeah, looks like that will be possible. Let me just make sure I have the right tab. This would be fun to see if I can do this. All right. And let me hit present on that. All right, can everybody see that? All right, I see nods. Um, I just took a moment. Um, so some of those of you who participated in this two years ago heard my lecture on matching sources and needs. Um, and I really wanted to start with needs and I just threw in an example of a tax measure and why. Um, and you know, having gone through the budget as we have, um, the needs for services are really high and I think the utility discussion we had was interesting. I'm gonna come back to that later. Um, I'm not sure why we would tax electric for climate. I think we might be better off taxing gas for climate. Um, although obviously, hopefully that will decline over time. Um, but the reason I put a parcel tax here is because you know these, these things that residents are asking for, they're used by residents. Um, so, and last time we didn't really talk too much about parcel tax by square footage, but if we were able to do that, we could adjust for the size of the household and property. Um, and I think there's a lot of equity concerns those come up down at the bottom. Um, affordable housing, you know, I, I think we're in the early stages of figuring out the many different ways we could, we could um, do this. The reason the business tax is always concerned me with affordable housing is that, you know, uh, what was it that uh, Councilmember Phil said that I know we had the number a few uh, at some point in the past month. Two thirds of the people who live in Palo Alto actually don't work in Palo Alto, and so their their earnings from elsewhere, um, which you know oftentimes are high if they're if they're purchasing a house here or renting at market rate, um, they're really coming from businesses outside of Palo Alto. So I'm not sure why we would tax businesses in Palo Alto to pay for affordable housing. It is the property owners who benefit from that. Um, uh, then when we get to train crossings, this is where we started down the business tax. Um, you know, the reason I've always felt there was a nexus between the business tax and transportation, particularly with the train crossings, is that the vast majority of people who used, I guess I should put this in the past tense, I'm not sure what the current numbers are, use that Caltrain station at University Avenue, don't live in Palo Alto. Um, and then finally, you know, thinking about bonds, I just wanted to start at sort of the high level, you know, the needs that we have and, and doing as sources and uses, like if we really were gonna do the very best fiscal policy, what could we match that up? Um, and the reason, of course, you do a bond is to fund major capital projects for residents over decades. Um, so I just wanted to do that. And then the other thing I did is um, a version of something that really caught everyone's attention when we did the library. <laughs> And this isn't to say we're spending too much money on our schools. It's to say that there is a method that we have not used for the city that the schools have used. Um, and I just tossed in a few assessed values here. Um, this is my own math. I may have made some mistakes, um, but I think it's interesting to reflect on this and, and have this help us orient. 
I mean, we all know, you know, that in the school parcel tax is used for services, right? The librarians at the at the schools and the things that people really want that are extra, the science teachers, and they have a bond that's used to fund their infrastructure. Um, so I just wanted to start with that. Um, that was a, a version of my usual lecture on that. Um, and then um, I'll, I'll talk about business tax, I think, in, in the next go round. Um, I wonder, does staff remember, we made a motion at some point. I think I made the motion and council member Phil says seconded it. We were back in the chambers um, and there was a percent that we had about the general fund. Um, I'm trying to remember, I, um, I saw a lot of the staff reports in there, but I don't know that that was referenced. I'm just trying to calibrate on attachment C here, attachment C6, page 74. I have a general memory of a 5% number of general fund. I want to say it was somewhere in that ballpark. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure the council fully uh, narrowed it. We can look at the action and it's really quickly, um, but we're somewhere in that five, no more than um, I want to say 10%. And do you remember how many millions we were estimating that that would generate? Anyway, that's that's just something to be helpful to get for for the next go round. It's not that we needed it at this instance, um, but you know we just spent so much time on the different um, methods, and you know I think we had three different ways of comparing and contrasting. So I don't want to lose that work that's been done. And Mr. Guagliardo has arrived. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so when I come back, I just want to talk a little bit more about um, our options with the utility taxes because I think those are really interesting. All right, Council Member Phil Seth. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm going to slingshot off uh, uh, Council Member Burt's uh, or Vice Mayor Burt's uh, 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 campaign ideas for the utility tax and say, uh, you want to destroy the planet or you want to fund the children's theater? Which one? <laughs> um, at least that's my mental model. Um, let me ask. Let me ask first a question about um, uh, um, some of these charts. And uh, let me see, I'm not sure it's the one on one is, is in this the, the presentation or the pack. It is, is not. Um, I'm looking for the, the chart in attachment C. Yeah, either table B2. Or any of the other ones, actually. B two is probably the best one, but um, uh, or B five. Actually, maybe B five. Either one of those. Is, is there any way you can put put one of those on the screen? Steve might have it. There we are. These in the right. Yeah, there, there you go. Can you blow up uh, that, that chart? That, that one's good. So I wanted to ask a question about this. So let, let's take Mountain View as an example. So if I understand this, uh, Mountain View collects $6 million in a year per year from their headcount tax. Okay. Uh, and the average revenue per headcount uh, is $9,438. So if you divide 6 million in revenue by nine and a half thousand people, it looks like they're only taxing it, applying a tax to 600 people in all of Mountain View. Is that, did, am, I, am I getting that right? So I think in this to Vice Mayor Burt's point, uh, one of the metrics that the consultant had used was FTE and FTE yeah. is staff. Um, yeah. So it's not, it's not a metric associated with um, who the tax is assessed on. It's rather just a metric in terms of the size of the organization. Um, oh, is that FT, is that, that people that FTEs that work for the city of Mountain View directly? Correct. Ah, Correct. thank you very much. Correct. Okay, and that so, makes much more sense. Yes. Okay, which explains why it's so much larger in San Jose because they got a lot of people working for the city of San Jose. That's correct. Okay, that's very helpful. 
Uh, I also wanted to ask a question. So I was trying to parse out the San Francisco one, and it looked like San Francisco's sunsetted in 2019. Did I get that right? They 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 eliminated it. What what happened there? Well. San Francisco has a number of different taxes. Uh, it is a rather complex structure. Some are business taxes, some are parcel-like taxes, uh, some are on different variables. So uh, one of their taxes was sunsetting um, because they were moving away, if I remember this correctly, they were moving away from payroll, I think, as a metric, right. yeah. um, as the unit of measure due to, well, frankly, complications and challenges. Uh, and moving towards uh, different units of measure. And so now uh, with their newer taxes, again, plural, um, they have sunsetted one and moved on to others. That was kind of, okay. So that was sort of keys into my next question, which is uh, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about uh, uh, Vice Mayor Burt's uh, observation that maybe there are some of these that apply to the you know, kind of for-profit nonprofits and some that don't. But um, uh, if you look at headcount taxes versus payroll taxes, which, which of those are easy to measure and administer? Headcount is easier than payroll. Than payroll, okay. And is it, is it, is it still practical to measure, to measure headcount? That is a darn good question and something that I think is untested at this point in time. Um, typically on a business tax, uh, if you're assessing it specifically on the business, they are mm -hmm. self-reporting mm -hmm. um, in terms of their headcount and right. what staff, uh, rather the path that we were down was that staff would use intelligence through um, sources like EDD, where we can't obtain specific headcount per, um, per business, but we can, as you saw in some of the tables, get headcounts um, by industry and by kind of range of size, we would use mm -hmm. those types of data sources to help us audit uh, the self-reported numbers. So mm -hmm. every business obviously does need to report their headcount by location to the state, um, the EDD. So we do have that as a, you know, backstop, so to speak, at a, a higher level. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously in the advent of this whole work from, tel work from home telework, Right. Who knows how easy it is to switch where someone's quote location is. Um, and do, it's and do, you, do you know if uh, uh, administration was part of the reason that San Francisco has moved away from their payroll tax? I believe so. That's part of it, um, as well as I think some challenges as well. well one of my observations is, you know, when we discussed this a couple of years ago, a lot of discussion around uh, a headcount tax as kind of being a logical nexus, because we were looking at transportation as a prime target for this, and headcount being a logical, you know, alignment with, uh, with transportation. However, as we got into it, you know, we started to get, it got more and more complicated about who we were going to carve out and which groups we were going to exempt and how we were going to, because fundamentally it's somewhat regressive. And, uh, uh, and you have, you know, the headcount, the, 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 the value per headcount in a restaurant is quite a bit different than it is in, uh, you know, in an autonomous vehicle company, right? And so uh, I sort of found myself sort of getting more interested in payroll just because it builds in, uh, it builds in automatically some of the progressiveness that we were sort of trying to artificially construct in, in trying to figure out exemptions and tiers and stuff like that. I gather that... Uh, the simplest of all, though, might be a parcel tax because. Uh, but am I correct in thinking about that? Because uh, it's easy to measure. It's easy to measure space, or is? Well, I guess you can measure land space. I don't know the building space. So that's a piece of it. Absolutely. Um, obviously, the assessor's office has square footage of the land, the parcel itself. So yeah. that is a very. Of of all the metrics, I would say that's uh, very simple. But obviously. Yeah the surface area of a lot uh, right. doesn't account for the height or depth essentially of that uh, facility or the, the structure that's on that parcel. Um, yep. So the, obviously the assessor's office does have square footage numbers. The thing okay. to consider when we do look at square footage is um, one, 
the assessor's office data sometimes can be outdated as things are being constructed or new permits are being pulled, et cetera. The other yep. thing to consider is, is who is the tax assessed on? So in many buildings or many facilities, there are common areas if the building mm -hmm. is shared. So <laughs> if it, <laughs> Okay, yeah. So as you can imagine, I'm sure the, the dots have connected in your head, but for the public's benefit, um, if you were to assess a tax on square footage of an individual business, then we would need to have very specific language on how you quote calculate the square footage of a business and how you would assess common areas, hallways, bathrooms, lobbies, elevators. Um, you, would, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't assess the property owner and then let them figure it out? So there's the other option. So you could do um, something like a parcel tax, which would be assessed on a property owner. Um, mm -hmm. And the property owner would be assessed the full tax based on um, whatever the square footage is of the asset that they own. Uh, and it would be their responsibility to uh, you know, adjust from there. I will say that also poses complications if the city wanted to exempt certain types of businesses, oh, I see, um, yes, of we course. wouldn't have insight. Um, right. And so what we've talked about previously um, was a type of kind of credit or refund like program, meaning you assess the full amount, but someone could apply for an exemption with some sort of appropriate backup that would um, exempt whatever uh, type of business or, or something like that. Um, so anyway, there are pros and cons, um, but those are some of the things that we would, if we were to go down the square footage path, things that we would need to iron out. Got it. And Steve, are you having any? Okay. Yeah, we're past five minutes. Thanks. Um, and when I come back, I want to, I, um, I want to understand a little more about EIFDs. Thanks. Okay. Back to the vice mayor on our round robin. Yeah. And, uh, I may have to drop the video because my image has been coming in and out there. Um, so first, um, just wanted to touch on the, um, the slide that uh, Chair Cormack had put up on the needs. I, I actually look at a number of those uh, quite differently. Uh, for instance, the grade separations, when we look at uh, uh, the users of Caltrain, which is not what's really the principal driver on the need for grade separations, but there's uh, some correlation there. Um, the fact that the users are not uh, predominantly Palo Alto residents uh, to me suggests that in fact they should be, their employers are the ones who should be uh, getting tax uh, to address that problem. Um, but in addition, um, we really, we have, we have to have grade separations because Caltrain's increasing the um, number of trains at peak hours uh, principally. Uh, and our traffic is highest at peak hours. I'm going to go to stop in video. Um, our traffic's highest at peak hours, um, principally because of the 100,000 or so workers that we have in our community um, uh, during uh, normal times, and the vast majority of those are commuters. Um, so in each case, those two drivers for why we need uh, grade separations are principally because of uh, business needs. And within that is Stanford University as well that is driving a lot of that traffic at those grade crossings. Um, and similar argument on affordable housing. Um, uh, it is the uh, most of all, not exclusively, but most of all this 100,000 uh, workers and the businesses um, that employ those folks that drive a housing need in the community and affordable housing need. That's what our jobs housing imbalance is about. Uh, and so I would see that the affordable housing nexus is principally to the business as well. Um, I would also like to just say that I, I really don't think that our choices boil down to uh, the children's theater or saving the planet. I think we can do both. Uh, or do our share on saving the planet. And I want to make sure- Sorry for the oversimplification. Yeah, and it's a dichotomy that I, I uh, have concerns with. Um, I do want to say that uh, it was alluded to on uh, San Francisco business taxes. And my recollection is, and we never got this through the consultants, but from the research uh, that the citizens committee that uh, I was involved with in 2018 and 19, who did the research and uh, essentially got council members to initiate this process then. Um, 
I think in aggregate, San Francisco's uh, business taxes were about $1,500 per employee averaged across all employees. So when I made that reference to the East Palo Alto, that was for the taxed employees of those businesses. If you take all employees of East Palo Alto, I don't know what their total number is, but you know, it's probably then cuts that $625 number maybe in half or who knows. So um, uh, the tax rate in San Francisco is that high. On the other hand, the average tax rate in Silicon Valley is um, uh, less than 5% apparently of what San Francisco charges on a per employee metric or a per square footage metric. And I was shocked to discover that. And uh, very surprised to see that elsewhere in the country, um, it's pretty common for cities to have um, uh, gross receipts taxes or payroll taxes. Um, and that Silicon Valley is best we've been able to reconstruct. Silicon Valley was born as a low cost suburb region to San Francisco. And over the decades, as it became one of the most affluent regions in the country or the world for that matter, we stayed an exceptionally low business tax region. We started off as an exceptionally low and this the discussion in Silicon Valley has never stepped back and said, how do we compare in business taxing despite housing some of the most profitable companies in the world, how do we compare to, um, to other cities? And, um, and instead what we've done is compared ourselves to our next door neighbors who were also exceptionally low business taxes. And that's kind of the, the high level comparison. Um, and I think when we look through this whole last upturn, San Francisco became a bigger version of Palo Alto to the tech community. And um, all the arguments of whether we would, would or wouldn't uh, have some impact on our competitiveness for tech jobs, um, San Francisco's a, a really good comparison. And I think that's a very important metric and we need to look at the aggregate of their taxes and not just one of their four taxes. Uh, on the payroll tax, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say that's five minutes. Okay. Um, all right, well, I'll just say on the payroll tax that um, uh, the problem is that first, only charter cities in California can have payroll taxes. And then San Francisco made this move. It was principally because I think it was in Los Angeles, there was a case and it brought into question whether the payroll tax would uh, be allowed in the future. And I don't remember the details. And so they made this uh, multi-year uh, movement to transition to an equivalent tax amount, but non-payroll. So um, I'll pick up later. Okay, um, yeah, uh, council member, yes, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say we have the answer for you, uh, Chair, on the previous motion. Okay. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Go for it. We'll take uh, the answer. All right. So the motion that the council had approved um, back in January of 2020, which was the uh, direction that staff used to develop what was the March 2020 staff report with all of the mass nations of a ballot measure structure. Um, and that's where when the council put everything on hold uh, with the pandemic. So the motion had stated that staff develop a potential local tax ballot measure, including but not limited to a general business tax that was based on employee headcount that raises approximately $10 million per year, um, that it was used for transportation projects and or services um, and affordable housing, uh, tiers with no additional exemptions um, that you know, giving small business a flat rate. Um, and it would have an annual escalator. And that was it. Okay. And our general fund was like, what, 230 then? Yes. Okay. So that was 4%. Okay. That, that all sounds very familiar. Thank you. That's helpful. Just orienting. Um, I do think at some point, um, and I don't know that it's today, but we're going to need to, as part of this process, identify the needs that we're funding with the various taxes and the amounts, because we could circle on this for a long time. Um, appreciate the staff saying that a $350 parcel tax, and that's kind of why I wanted to show that, that um, slide that had all of the numbers of what people are paying today in Palo Alto. 
um, and that's with no exemptions, would be $7 million, for example, in annual revenue. Okay, that's, that's helpful. 350 is not insignificant, but it's certainly, um, it, seems, it seems within the realm of possibility. Um, table A2, I, I think the vice mayor had asked this question about healthcare, but I didn't quite understand it. Um, on packet page 58, is healthcare in this list or not? A2, it's got hospitality and flex building and doesn't seem like healthcare is a, it says rentable building square feet. I just don't. I actually think it might be in there. Okay, well, we'll that's just to something check. to clarify since you know we have so many large healthcare providers um, in terms of you know space as well as employees. I will say though, um, Council Member Cormack, to the extent the health facility is a government health facility, it wouldn't be included in there. So healthcare can be a number of- Oh, so the of, VA, for example. Correct. Ah, yeah. It took me a moment. I had to drive around and then I realized which one you were talking about. <laughs> so so it, just, it depends on kind of the exclusions as we move through the details. Yeah. Um, I do think one thing that would be helpful when we come to council is sort of like collecting in a table um, these like the $350 parcel would be 7 million if you did it on that, um, you know, square feet. When now I'm looking at attachment, I'm looking at attachment A8, uh, table A4, right? So if we wanted $200 million, that's $356 per million. So that's actually pretty comparable to the parcel tax at a million, right? And then that gets you 200 million, but has a debt service of 13. I just think laying out these numbers will help us sort of triangulate what are the needs that we're trying to, to pay for. I mean, it won't help us triangulate the needs, but it'll help us figure out which, which one to match with that. Um, okay, what else do I have here? Um, I don't recall, maybe I missed it two years ago, that we talked about varying what the documentary transfer tax. So it's interesting to see that um, basically San Francisco looks like it has a surcharge at a certain level. Um, I, I remember us sort of dismissing the documentary transfer tax pretty early in the process. Um, that, that's something that holds a little bit more appeal. I don't know that it would necessarily still be volatile. I don't know exactly what we had assign it to, but I, that, that holds more interest to me. I'd also want to know though, um, I understand, you know, traditionally the seller pays it, but I'd want to know what's really happening on the ground. I think that's probably negotiated often to have the buyer do it. So I just like a little bit more information on that before we make any of those decisions. Oh, Mr. Guardiardo pops right back up. Um, I'm here to not only tell you that five minutes, but also that medical was included in office in table A2 that you were Okay, at. so office included medical. Okay, great. I'm going to go note that on here so I don't ask that next time. Wow, I got a bonus. Thanks for that. Um, yes, next um, I'll want to talk about the affordable housing. And then at some point we should probably shift gears to the timeline. Okay, and you know what I'm going to suggest? Um, why don't we just take a five minute break? Everybody, let's just take a five minute break. Let's come back at 745 and then council member Phil Seth will be up. Come back and you're up. Council member Phil Seth. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Uh, it was about but, the yeah the, the infrastructure district. yeah infrastructure finance and districts. I wanted to ask a little bit that was kind of interesting. So if I if, if I understand what I read here is that you know, no public vote is needed to establish one. That's correct. What's what is kind of the what is the what are the constraints of the assessments? I mean, how are those? What what what's the, what latitude do we have on? Uh, on, on how those could work. So I will say first, I am not an expert on this. Um, I've 
read a bit about them, have not been in a city that has participated, so I don't have kind of that ground level experience. My understanding is that um, essentially what would happen is the local government would create it, and it um, can also be created with the support of the county government. Um, so for example, if the county participates, they could put their increment of tax that they would receive into it as well. Otherwise, it would just be, you know, the city's increment of tax. School districts are prohibited from joining, so you can't take any increment of property tax that would go to fund um, local schools. Hopefully that, that makes sense. So that's kind of the general structure. The city would create a board. It has a name, which I've forgotten. I can look that up. Um, essentially have a certain number of members on that board. That board then creates a plan of mm -hmm. what, would that, what that financing district would support. So it might say, okay, this financing district is going to be one, it has to be a specific area. They don't have to be contiguous areas. So there could be one district in the city that is actually several different um, areas of Palo Alto, but okay. under one umbrella. And then mm -hmm. there would be a plan of what exactly is gonna be funded. And then that board and that, that JPA essentially has to approve that plan um, so that you know there's only certain things that can be funded. So you, it's kind of tight in that regard, okay. but um, in terms of infrastructure, it is pretty um, wide range of infrastructure. It can be housing, it can be you know transportation, it could be connectivity. Um, so a lot of cities, um, and what I was looking at some case studies is like, they may have a big investment coming in. So for example, a light rail station. So they wanna prepare for transit oriented development. Perhaps the private development will happen, but what is gonna be the public investment um, surrounding them? It could be a park, library, things like that to oh, go yes. along with the, the private mm -hmm. development. So hopefully that gives a bit of color of kind of what they could be used for and um, can share more information <clears throat> helpful. Yeah, th yeah, thanks, that's interesting. So it sounds like it's pretty flexible as long in what you use it for as long as you define it, right? Um, how about in terms of, of how you assess? I mean, do you sort of still have all the tools? You can assess people on parcel size, on, you know, on employee count, on, on I mean, are, are all, the, all those still sort of apply? So it's it's um, the increment. So this is essentially the state's effort, some would say, to restore redevelopment, which mm -hmm. ended in, what, 2013, I think, was when it ended, or 2012. Yep. So yep. it's kind of bringing back the increment in a way. And so it's really, um, again, tends to be more focused on areas where a, a city or jurisdiction believes there will be an increase in property right. values and an increase right. in property tax revenues. And then I it's see. setting aside that increment that's going to be generated from that area to be used for the infrastructure, you know, in those designated areas. Uh, I didn't quite understand that. So, so the source of funding is property tax increases, as opposed to, we're going to assess everybody, uh, you know, a dollar a square foot on the building. Correct. There are other um, kind of funding mechanisms that aren't really for affordable housing that would be more like a bid or a green benefits district that does assess the parcels and then uses right. the revenue from that parcel to support activities within that area, but it's not usually for things as big as uh, building housing, um, more for maintenance or could, other could, activities. Could it be? I would have to look into bid law to know more about what can be used, but there are some restrictions on what bids can fund and it does have to support, um, I think there's some, some rules around how it needs to provide service to all the members of the bid. And so I don't know if housing would be qualifying as something that would provide service to all the bid members. I mean, hypothetically speaking here, I mean, could you, so if, if you wanted to say, okay, we've got this section of town and we got some industrial policy ideas going on here and we wanna designate this section of town really to be intensive on this use, okay? And if you're already in that section of town and doing something different, that's okay, you can stay, but you have to help fund the shift to this other use. Um, I, sounds like that's not necessarily the, the primary target of the uh, IFD. I mean, I think with the infrastructure finance industry, you probably could do something like that, you know, okay. this area. I mean, because I think a lot of them are kind of built around, this is an area where we're going to have some changes going on. Right. And so we need some public infrastructure to accompany those private changes. 
Um, yeah. And so it doesn't, unlike a bid, for example, bid is um, folks in an area are voting to assess themselves, right? right. So that's kind of a different right. thing. This is yep. not voter approved. This is the, no. you know, the representatives, the government of that area is. Yeah, no, this is this is top down. We're saying, you know, we've decided we're going to go this way. Right. right. And it, because it's from the property taxes, it's not actually an assessment on, it's not an, so the, the businesses in that area in the e, uh, financing district wouldn't feel a difference. They're going to pay their property taxes based on the um, property tax structure of that jurisdiction. But again, that right. increment. So if, you know, one year their property tax is $1,000, the next year it's 2000 that thousand dollar increment, the portion that would be for the city would go to the financing district to then spend on the um, projects that it's going to spend on. Right, but that's an important point, isn't it? Because if I understand what you just said, it's essentially revenue neutral to the city. That is correct. Well, I guess Kylie, you might wanna, I see her saying it's maybe not. So let me give back that question to her. Sure, uh, to, at a, a basic level, essentially yes. But at a broader level, forecasts have assumed growth in property taxes for a number of estimated reasons. And what right. this does is this caps that growth in that specific area right. at that base level in that year. And any of that growth no longer goes towards your general forecast and is shaved off and goes to the financing district. But so it sounds like, it sounds like we're sort of taking one taking money from one city pot and putting it in a different city pot, right? Uh, as opposed to it's a new source of revenue. That, that could be one way to look at it. I mean, I think the idea is that often, um, instead of just using the cash outright, there will be bonds issued. So you're leveraging the, you're leveraging it. I mean, you could just pay for stuff straight up, but um, often it's leveraged through bonds, which do not require voter approval to generate even more revenue to then um, build the infrastructure. And then that debt is serviced with the increment. Um, but, to and, issue, but to issue the bonds, you need voter approval. You don't need it if it's in the earned, if it's in the infrastructure financing district. That's a recent change oh, as of I 2020. See. That oh, voter approval of 55% was required. That's no longer required. So not okay. to like to to muddy this with NVCAP and I see Steve patiently waiting for me to stop talking. But um, you know, for example, if an NV, if and when NVCAP is passed, maybe that's an infrastructure financing district because the city is saying. We, we're going to have this private development. We want to add some public dollars in here. We're going to use this to um, to invest or whatever area the city wanted to. But again, it, it does need to be a defined area or set of areas within the city. You can't just say, oh, it's all city um, that we're going to you know, take our increment. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Pay no attention to Steve, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, all right. So, Vice yeah. Mayor Burt. Yeah. Uh, just a follow-up question on that. So I want to make sure I'm clear that the uh, property tax dollars that go into the IFD are only the city share dollars uh, of property tax. Is that correct? That's my understanding, although counties can join. So it can be a joint powers authority that has um, the local government and the county participating. Um, sometimes counties don't want to. They can also join later. Um, so it kind of oh, depends. Gotcha. Okay, and then I um, had a couple uh, thoughts on the timeline. Um, first, when would this go to council? Which portion? Well, what the recommendations out of the finance committee? Uh, out of tonight, they're scheduled for August. Okay, so uh, what you had on the timeline was moving forward essentially based upon the finance committee recommendation then, huh? You're talking about, um, or you're saying nothing would happen until after it went to council? Assuming you... that the committee's recommendation to council is to uh, you know, pursue the path forward essentially, a ballot measure and the like, staff would start the work associated with uh, figuring out what it means to bring on all the contractors. Uh, and okay. Gotcha. Uh, but ultimately, we wouldn't sign anything or, or make any right. final action until the council okay. action. And then I am a little concerned that this aspect of the timeline is uh, a bit optimistic. Um, if we look at the timeline, you know, yeah, there's argument that previous work was done, but uh, we look at the previous timelines on things like this, and uh, I'm concerned that maybe we're being optimistic. On the other hand, the uh, the uh, tasks in the first half of 2020, 
uh, three might have some additional room, but I, I just want to make sure that we're looking at this realistically. Um, and then um, I did want to touch on something, and in, in it, it kind of goes to the scale of, of the tax. As the, um, the council and the committee previously had looked at um, several different changes, and we had council members who went we're all the way from uh, being flat out opposed to any business tax uh, to those that were interested in something along the lines of what uh, I was describing earlier, uh, and then uh, ones in between. And it's, uh, what was moving forward was one in between, and then once again, it was based in part on this metric of, of um, uh, either dollars per full-time uh, uh, equivalent employee or percentage of the general fund. And I think that actually the much more appropriate uh, basis for the scale of a business tax are first, what are the needs? And those have changed for us. When we were looking at this previously, we were focused principally on transportation, both infrastructure and, and, and operations of, of, for trip reductions and affordable housing. Uh, but we all know now that we have um, the impacts that are have cut our our basic services drastically, and um, and so that adds a whole another dimension. And on top of that, there are other uh, potential needs as well. And then the the counter the other side of that coin on needs is what's what's essentially uh, not going to have a unduly negative impact on businesses. And I did want to. Um, say that uh, the EASE acronym um, actually has in there that the, uh, the tax would promote economic development. And in, in a direct way, I can't see how any business tax promotes economic development. There may be some indirect benefits, but I think that's, that's an incorrect metric for a business tax. Uh, and um, uh, what we don't want to do is have something that is harmful to economic development in a significant way. Um, we want to net out favorably from this in a, to a significant degree. Um, and so then what, what scale should this be? And um, just to give you a reference point, uh, if we had something similar to what East Palo Alto has at 20 cents a square foot per month, um, our average uh, office rate is actually up around eight bucks a square foot. We talked about we have a pretty good deal on this uh, space out by the wastewater treatment plant, but um, there are published uh, reports that show that uh, 15 miles away in San Jose, they average four dollars a square foot. And that was, you know, a, this is a, a year ago data. I don't know what's uh, changed more recently, um, but that means that companies are paying. Um, four bucks a month premium to be in Palo Alto. And then regionally and even locally, we're paying, uh, these companies are paying salary premiums to be in Palo Alto. And regionally, the premiums that were getting paid were enormous per employee. Um, so if an, an, an employee um, uh, occupies 250 square feet and um, uh, that's um, at, uh, a premium of four bucks a square foot. Um, so that is a thousand dollars a month or twelve thousand dollars a year just in rent premium they're paying. And then most of these companies regionally, high tech workers, there was call it a fifty thousand dollar a year premium. We we should look into that more. So I just want to put that context that these the companies between the the salary premium and the um, and the rent premium. Um, they're paying enormous amounts uh, so that a tax at the range that I was talking about that might raise us say $30 million a year is about 1% of the premium they're paying to be in Palo Alto or, or our region. And when we look at it that way, that's not onerous. Uh, in fact, um, really what we're doing is that the developers and the property owners are able to charge that kind of premium on rent and they've made billions and billions of windfall in this most recent upturn. And the market will only pay a certain amount 
for rent. And that amount, um, uh, if, if there's a tax, then eventually it trickles into the, uh, uh, the amount that they can charge on their rent or their lease. And ultimately, it's, it comes out of how much increase above inflation those uh, commercial property owners are able to charge. So I'll leave that concept uh, because I think it frames very differently uh, what is a reasonable business tax amount and whether we can in fact have a business tax that would truly address our needs um, versus one that would still leave us in a deep hole. Okay, I'm just continuing to work my way through the staff report, almost there, and then I'm gonna come back to the timeline a bit. Um, the California Community Housing Agency, I'm not sure if it's pronounced Calcha, it sounds a lot like a dance. Um, that's how it looks like it's pronounced. Um, I, I have um, spoken with Catalyst, um, which is the organization that um, helps implement this and connected them with um, planning and development. Um, so I think um, there's an opportunity there. Mountain View is already you know, down the path and you know, they've already, um, there's already active work there. So I think that's something we should do. It's not, you know, um, it depends on your definition. We can have affordable and there is a little bit more flexibility in the AMI numbers. Um, than you would imagine online. So I think that's definitely something that, that we as a city should consider um, once the staff has had a chance to take a look at it and understand the ordinance. I mean, the, the, tri the tricky part there is that it does take it out of the property tax rolls. So that's the one negative, um, just for everyone to be aware of. It sounds really great um, and, it, and it probably is really great, um, but then it would no longer be paying property tax. Um, okay, coming back to the schedule, I can concur um, that the um, the plan is compressed, ambitious. Um, it's probably doable. And I guess the, the reason that it would be good to do it this way, having been on a campaign committee, is that it would allow whatever campaign committee there might be the time to do the work um, in 2022. Um, and that is, it is really non-trivial, especially for any of these that need to hit a two-thirds majority. Um, so I, I think that sticking with the plan um, should be our, our first choice, um, but it would be understandable if we, if we had to loop a little bit um, on that. Okay, let's see, coming back. Um, I don't think we've done a very good job helping staff think through the needs per se, and I don't know that we'll be able to do that today, but I think some range of a table of needs in these general categories would help orient council when we make the decision, how much in, you know, in services, um, you know, how much, like, um, remind me how much we spent on, um, on Wilton court all up. We've, uh, between 45 and $50 million for was the project and the city contributed 22. Okay. 22 staffs concurring with our, uh, our assistant. Uh, <laughs> okay, great. Um, you know, if we wanted to look at that, that's, um, you know, if you're just trying, that's a parcel tax of $1,000, for example, right? If we did it a parcel tax version, um, it'd be interesting to just think about if we wanted to do one of those every year, right? Well, that, then how would we raise $22 million every year if we wanted to give that to a community land trust instead? Um, I think, you know, it's, I don't know if it'd been five years since we'd done an affordable housing Maybe we'd only done two in 10 years, but you know, what would it take if we were gonna build one of those every year? I think that would be a good uh, place to orient ourselves. Um, and then we haven't really talked very much about the capital project problem, um, but I do think we have that. And I think we'll probably have it even more going forward. And so stepping back from business tax, which I know is you know, of interest um, to many and just, Again, trying to match sources and uses of funds, I think it's worth us thinking about. Um, do we bond only, I mean, do we bond a, a general amount, you know, the way the school district does? Um, I just throw that out there because I don't know that this is the year to sort that out. Maybe next year when we have a better sense of which sources of revenue have rebounded and which amounts. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the assumption we had a couple of years ago about how we were going to fund these capital projects. Is, um, is much riskier now than we had thought. So um, don't know that we're gonna sort that out today. 
Um, and the other thing with the transportation is it wasn't just infrastructure, right, that we had talked about. It was also infrastructure and services, right, making, making sure that there are shuttle service available for everyone. Um, I think there's a lot of transportation opportunities um, in terms of the need. So those are sort of the four buckets I have, the, um, the services that um, people want, and we've, we've been relying on visitors to pay for affordable housing, what would it take if we were going to build one every year, right? How much money would that be? And then looking at um, capital projects, whether it be, you know, city funded city, city facilities like Coverly or the animal shelter, or whether it be whatever contribution we're going to need to make to grade separation. Hello, Mr. Guardiardo. Um, and I just wanted to thank um, Ms. Tanner for explaining that part with the NV cap, right? Because that, that particular um, mechanism would be best used in a place when you know that there's gonna be an increase, right? In the property taxes. And I, I think it's hard to imagine a place that it would be at, at such a rate that would make sense, except perhaps there in the event it was implemented. So um, that's a helpful thing to think about a, a, a method to, to provide those um, amenities a different method to provide those amenities. That's how I'm going to say it. <laughs> was that just last night? It was. All right. Um, with that, it's 810. Um, and I think at this point, we should start moving towards motions. So maybe on this round, just go through your ABCD um, that the staff had. So staff want to toss that back up there, the recommendation. And Council Member Philseth, you're up first in the batting order. Well, I actually had some more questions. Um... But uh, I, yeah, I that's think that, fine too. I said we take the staff, all the time we need. Find the staff, 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 staff recommendations appropriate at this point. Um, still curious about uh, the specificity and the, the surgicality with which we could use some of these mechanisms. Um, could we do, for example, uh, as part of a palette of, uh, of, of mechanisms, could we do a a partial tax targeted specifically at a given sector? For example, could we do a, a partial tax that specifically applied to medical facilities? Is that legal? I think so, Kylie. Yeah, I think so. Uh, about, the metric, how, it cannot be ad valorem, uh, but if it was either a flat rate or some other- uh, footage. Yeah, square footage or something. Sure. For square footage, we could do that. Okay. Um, how about targeted to a specific geography? You say, uh, you know, Midtown. We're going to have a partial tax in Midtown, but not uh, Barrett Park. Is that legal? We'd have to have draw you the ever heard of that. Yeah. There. <laughs> Sorry. We haven't heard of that. Um, I suspect there would be a boundary map that we would need to draw. Um, that's common in things like what Ms. Tanner who was talking about um, and having those maps for assessments or districts. We could look at that. It, yeah. I can't think of every reason off the top of my head why that would not be permissible. And, and could those things be, uh, we're gonna have a partial tax on medical facilities in uh, Midtown, but, uh, but grocery stores in, uh, in Barron Park? We, we would need to look at this. Yeah. Um, there are, I mean, there are certain mechanisms where in an assessment district, it, it's the tax entities that vote. Um, right. So you're not talking about that. You're talking about a sort of a business tax that would be highly targeted based right. on sector and or geography. Uh, geography. I mean, I mean. I mean, or, or, or business buildings painted blue, for example. I think the, the boundary, perhaps, criteria is both uh, political, which is maybe stating the obvious and the ability yep. to make the case that there is yep. a nexus between the charge and the who is charged, uh, but also, quite frankly, administratively uh, and the complexity involved with that. And so while just... Noting that as a, as a general concept, I do think it will be relevant as we get into the specifics of any proposal that our ability to administer in a way that ensures uh, uh, 
would say uh, protection from challenge that right. we're making mistakes along the way will, will become more relevant. What what would be the what would be the the primary concern about challenges for something like that? I mean, do we actually have to show a nexus? You have to show a nexus with the jurisdiction to tax. It's a constitutional, a basic constitutional requirement of the taxing power. In other words, we can't tax economic activity that occurs in Mountain View. That's right. the reason why why right. we tax that portion of business activity that either the physical location or employees who work here, or et cetera. Right. I think, but yeah, but, let's, uh, again, I'm sorry, not, not a legal argument, but once again, a political one, but one that you see play out all the time in terms of the fairness argument. And yeah. so will it be fair if there are like businesses across the street where one pays and the other doesn't? It, right. It can be easy to argue against uh, right. the, in the campaign. Right, I understand. Okay, okay. I understand, I, yeah. No, both are, both are important. It's just, I can't think about both at once. <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, you know, more generally, so I, on the size, uh, I certainly, uh, if we can, if we can get $30 million a year, then I'm, I, I'm not going to argue against that. Um, it looks to me like uh, the most direct need is that uh, the gap on sort of basic city services, uh, your fourth bullet there. Uh, I, I defer to staff on, on what that actually is, but ballpark, it looks to me like about $15 million a year. So that's uh, more than we had talked about in the last round. Um, uh, but it also doesn't include things like grade separation. And if we're going to have to fund that someday, we're going to leave a lot of money. Um, more broadly, on, uh, I kind of I concur with uh, uh, the vice mayor a little bit on uh, appropriateness of various mechanisms. I think, uh, you know, particularly in the light of COVID, and we understand our, our our region a little better now and uh, uh, you know the big picture of this remains that the valley driven primarily by the tech sector although to some extent by the healthcare sector as well has made you know generated massive wealth and not invested enough of it in transportation and housing and to some extent social services. Um, and that's a problem. And so where does the money come from to do this stuff? Well, it, it, it flows downhill from the tech sector and to some extent the health sector. And if we're ever to get uh, to a sustainable uh, model as a region, then we got to fund this stuff appropriately and the, really the only place it can come from is uh, is is you know is the tech sector which has generated the wealth of the valley right and so we got to make moves in that direction and, and you know and historically especially coming out of the last recession we haven't done that and you know the the because nobody wants to do that because it makes so much money right i mean everybody likes to have a lot of money and high paying jobs and all this kind of stuff and nobody wants to spend more money than they have to on other stuff and palo alto took its first steps to getting off that merry-go-round when we started laying in office caps in 2015. I mean, we just said, wait a second, you know, this is nuts, okay? And we said, we're not gonna play that game anymore even if it costs us in the short run. And I think, you know, at some point we were always gonna have to go a step further than that. And, you know, other cities in the region are starting to do this kind of stuff as well, you know, Mountain View and East Palo Alto and a couple of these measures in San Francisco too, which kind of comes back to the, to the vice mayor's point about, uh, business taxes, uh, not having his, existed historically in the valley and so forth. But, you know, if we're going to fund this stuff, it's got to come from somewhere. And there's only one place where the money is. And that's where we're talking about here. And so um, it's not going to come from, you know, putting duplexes on single family lots and stuff like that. It's, it's going to take money, right? And, and, and this is where it is. So I think this is the direction we're kind of moving in. Um, and uh, for the really wonky... Uh, uh, not for this meeting, but uh, I'm prepared to argue all day long that we suffer from something called Dutch disease, which has nothing to do with tulips, right? Uh, but uh, makes a lot of sense for this region. <laughs> Dutch syndrome, right? Not Dutch elm disease. Uh, I think North so. uh, North 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 Sea oil and gas. Yeah, yeah. You you. I read the I read the article. 
uh, the study. Okay, Vice Mayor Burt. Yeah, um, so first, uh, I really do uh, concur with um, what uh, Councilmember Philseth was just describing uh, in terms of uh, this, uh, this problem for our region and our city. And at its core uh, is that uh, we have had some of the most uh, successful e economy in the world and been stuck at an exceptionally low business tax rate regionally. Now the state taxes, the feds tax, but our local cities do not. Uh, and that has dug a hole uh, that has uh, had this incredible disconnect and, and people from afar will go, well, wait a minute, there's, how can you know, other cities and things and sister cities and they'll question, how can you not have resources like you need for affordable housing and the transportation when you have so much wealth generated by your companies? And the answer is they keep that wealth or they give it to the state, but they, they don't go to the cities. Um, I do want to note that um, we have coming up uh, next week the uh, affordable housing impact fee, and uh, I understand now that uh, uh, the, if we go through a few, full nexus study uh, to update that fee from what we had looked at, we were planning on doing in late 2016 and early 2017, that uh, incoming council reversed that action, um, uh, then uh, if we if we don't update it, but merely use that older nexus, um, then we may be able to streamline that timeline and then later update um, that nexus, and that would be valuable um, because uh, that the was authors also, of the memo would like to move would like to vote on it next week if people are willing. Yeah, um, and um, uh, that that fee was actually the fee that was also used by Stanford, and so when we didn't elevate our fee. They stayed stuck um, at the 30 something dollars a square foot that we've been charging. And so our increase would have doubled the increase in affordable housing, just the city share and Stanford share. And that's how we paid for Buena Vista primarily. Our share was through uh, those Stanford fees. Um, so then I, I just want to say more broadly, as we go around in circles, and it's the same thing that cities, every city goes through and we go through when looking at, at business taxes, really any tax, uh, there's no perfect tax. And every tax has complexities to it. It has inequities to it um, and, uh, and imperfections. And if we pursue the perfect, we're never going to get there. Uh, also, a premise we should have uh, is that, um, in general, those who um, uh, oppose a tax at all will uh, advocate that we should support or pursue the tax that's least likely to pass on the ballot. And uh, the business community um, demonstrated that the last go around. They demonstrated that in, in 09. They have a self-interest. Uh, it may be a short-sighted, more narrow self-interest, but they have that self-interest because they'd be the ones being taxed. And so they're going to advocate for the specific tax uh, and they'll ar argue it on philosophical grounds and fairness grounds. Uh, but uh, more than coincidentally, it aligns with a less, uh, lesser likelihood of passing. Um, and then finally, as we look, one of the things in looking at complexity of these taxes, in general, um, the more we try to address a fine tuning of the tax and uh, addressing inequities or, or uh, uh, more finely uh, 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 refining um, who should get taxed the most, the complexity of a tax generally diminishes its chances of passing. So that's a trade-off that is a real dilemma. Uh, and uh, it's something we should just anticipate and somehow uh, we, we could have the thing that is we think is closest to an ideal tax, uh, but it reduces its chance of passing. Um, and uh, I'll I just say too that I'll, I'll, I can get with staff offline, but uh, as it goes forward to the council, there are some things in the history of this that uh, I think we need to, um, uh, there are a few things that aren't quite correct that I can provide, but it's not that germane. Um, as far as the um, perspective motion, uh, if maybe we can get that back on the screen. 
Um, it's pretty uh, vanilla uh, and uh, just enables staff to uh, move forward uh, as uh, Ms. Nose had described in the coming months and, and for this to be referred to the council uh, for their consideration. Um, and so I think it doesn't really require us to refine any of the things we've been talking about or narrow them. And so I would move the staff recommendation. Is there a second? Well, if you're not sure. interested. Yes. Okay. Um, so I think I've spoken to it enough and uh, I'm good. Council Me too, but my expectation has been set for 30 million, so. Uh... Okay, well, I, I actually don't think moving the staff motion, I don't think we're answering the questions they need us. Um, staff, I mean, were you looking for us to do some of the narrowing in A, for example, and to provide any direction in C and D? Sure. Um, I think staff at uh, bar minimum need the committee to agree with the work plan to move forward to council. If the committee uh, is able to narrow uh, now, obviously all the better um, as we move towards this. Um, any narrowing, frankly, um, is helpful at any point as we continue to march down this path. Um, one thing that I'll just offer to the committee um, that as I've been taking notes and looking at things, a lot of the, not to say that this is uh, the narrowing that the committee would want, it may be too narrow, but just the themes that I've heard in everybody's comments collectively really circle around things like a square footage as a unit of measure. Um, and so maybe that might be something that we are narrowing uh, if we wanna take other things off. Not, not specifically directing a parcel tax versus a business tax, but there is a lot of, there was a lot of discussion about square footage. Um, that's one area. Another one is there was discuss of desire to continue looking at curing the utility transfer, whether it be just the part in question or uh, the transfer in whole. That's another area that we might, uh, the committee may consider narrowing. Um, and then the third thing I would say is when we talked about affordable housing funding, the things that really stuck out to me as areas that the committee is interested in further looking at was that Cal HSA, the, the catalyst funding, the, you know, more specifically CHA, thank you, uh, Rachel, the Cal CHA, uh, the EFID. Um, so that's the financing specifically as, as we're working towards things like NVCAP. And then the third thing I heard was impact fees, which as you noted are coming forward on Monday through a colleague's memo. So anyway, those are the major things I wanted to share with the committee. And those are potentially areas that uh, you could narrow your direction to the- Can, can, can I dive in a little bit? My, uh, my uh, I would only, my, my interest in the IFD uh, only goes as far as its uh, net increase in revenue to the city overall, as opposed to just pushing money from one pot to another. So if it's just pushing money from one pot to another, I think we can do that ourselves without having to declare a formal IFD. Um, if there's a way that it can be a net revenue enhancement, then I think it's, it's very interesting. The part where I was asking about sort of, you know, targeting of parcel taxes and stuff like that, which is, you know, could we, could we synthesize something that was a little closer to redevelopment through other means than an IFD? Okay. Um, does the maker wish to modify his motion at all? If not, I'll just go with some amendments. Um, I don't think I'm ready to at this time, but I'll uh, listen to what you propose. Okay, well, I would suggest, for example, in A, removing payroll and gross receipts, and I will say why. Payroll is super tempting for all the reasons Council Member Phil Seth identified, and we went round the merry-go-round on that two years ago. And in terms of administratability, um, it's just extremely difficult. Um, so as tempting as it is, I, I don't think it's feasible. And gross receipts was the same, was a, a different concern, but um, you know, for the same reasons. So I would propose that we eliminate payroll and gross receipts from this list. 
So I realized I, that neither of you were, well, I think Pat, excuse me, Vice Mayor Bird, I think you might've watched, but I, Council Member Phil says, were you on finance that year? I don't think so. I don't recall. I don't know. I, okay. I, I, I hate to give up the, I, I'm, I'm good with gross receipts. I hate to give up the ghost on payroll because I think, you know, if it could be done, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of good reasons to try to go that direction if it's feasible. Yeah, and um, I'd actually give up on headcount first. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've I've uh, I've voiced my inclination toward uh, square footage. Uh, but, I like square footage, but um, I I know from prior council discussions that there was a lot of sentiment last time leaning toward headcount. Um, the payroll is one that uh, I think we really need some legal guidance. I, I know that other cities, uh, uh, I, I, Council Member Du Bois had just uh, visited some cities in the Midwest who all had payroll. Um, and it's a very common um, uh, form of tax throughout the country for cities. Uh, it surprised me that it was, but as I learned more, I've been surprised. So I, I am not inclined to do a payroll, but I don't think we have the information in front of us on the legality in California. Uh, San Francisco moved away but, from it, but I've, I've heard that um, it's, it's perhaps their fears were not um, affirmed. And so um, uh, I, I would look forward to getting a next round of information that would enable us to narrow it, including from the council as a whole. Um, and um, so I, I, I don't think either payroll or gross receipts are ready to be eliminated, uh, even though I have my own inclinations. Okay, and would we like to, um, would the maker like to amend B to make any suggestions to staff based on our discussion today? Um, you could narrow it to gas. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be game to narrow it uh, to gas. Um, and that doesn't preclude a, um, not just a, um, uh, replacing the revenue loss, but it could also include um, a, mm -hmm. a climate protection element. Right. And what does staff think about that? Well, I'll speak for myself here. I personally would prefer to keep the option open with respect to electric, not knowing where the circumstances of uh, uh, shoring up will, will lead. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. I guess that rules out doing you guys a favor by narrowing it so far. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I, I, the thought. <laughs> I'm not sure I was very clear. Okay. It wasn't, not with narrowing, but with suggesting, do we wish to cure the problem? Do we wish to backfill the potential problem? Or do we wish to use this as a method to fund the additional services that are potentially not covered going forward? Well, that's different from what utility we tax. That's a whole different question. Well, it just said a utility use space tax, right? But what I what I heard from the city attorney is we would have the ability to do that in a more straightforward, efficient way in that manner. Did I miss something? No, both of those are policy questions that you ultimately will need to answer. Um, I'm all for narrowing also to focus, but I think on this one, you might wanna keep your options open a little longer, at, at least through the conversation with the council. Why don't we? Why, yeah. Why don't we do that? I think. I think. You know, Ed, 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 Ed knows we're sort of fixated on gas for this, and we don't tremendously want to discourage electricity use you know, relative to gas. On the other hand, if staff comes up with something creative and innovative that involves electricity, then I think we should look at it. In all honesty, I'll speak for staff. Really, the area that is helpful for the committee to narrow is on the business tax side of things. So yeah, one, yeah, just narrowing to a business tax is helpful, uh, whether mm -hmm. it be a parcel or a business tax, uh, so be it. Um, but narrowing that this is the area to continue to focus. And then uh, in uh, full transparency, it was quite a lift and again not resource to do just headcount tax and the committee was right. great in making decisions so trying to pursue one two three at least four different potential units of measure the legality associated with each of them the case studies of each of them um, again i think will be difficult 
to be honest. Um, so I would even argue that if the committee is able to rank them in preference order or tier one versus tier two, so staff has some guidance on where to focus our additional research. Um, for, for, for me, for me, square footage and payroll are tier one and the others are tier two. And for me, square footage is uh, and payroll um, uh, really because I have these open questions on uh, difficulty to administer and legality. Right. Uh, well, mine would be headcount and square footage. I'm going to say tied for different reasons. And then I, I've spent, I don't, unless there's new information on payroll and gross receipts, I don't, I don't think that's the, the direction I'd be interested in going. Um, and I'll just come back to like, what is it that we're going to use this for? If it's transportation, I think headcount as this, you know, there's a lot of argument for that. I, I, I don't, I don't disagree at all on headcount. This, I'm, I'm colored by, I'll try to twist your, or convince you on this. I'm colored by when we went through it last time on headcount, we sort of got into a lot of weedy details on it, on trying to how to structure it and make extensions and amendments and adjustments and so forth to compensate for the fact that, you know, different kinds of businesses do different things and the impact to different, depending on what kind of business it is and how big they are and so forth, uh, we really have dramatic impacts. And we said, well, our, uh, we're going to exempt, maybe we're going to exempt retail or maybe we're going to exempt, uh, you know, small bit, small services with less than 20 people. And so we got sort of got into a bunch of weedy details about that kind of stuff. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, uh, payroll simplifies that a lot, right? And it's still a proxy for headcount, but it factors in sort of the economic differences between headcount in terms of size of business and nature of business area and a bunch of other stuff like that. And that's sort of how I was looking at payroll is, okay, it's, it's not payroll versus headcount, it's payroll versus headcount with all these extensions that we're gonna wanna do. So that was, that was, that's, I, that's my mentality. I was the last one to leave payroll and I left it like, you know, with kicking and screaming, they dragged you me off of soon. payroll. I, you know, um, and, and I'm happy to go down this. And again, if there's new information, I don't disagree with you, but you know, we spent a lot of time on this right. um, and we, we can dig up, dig up why that, uh, you know, there were some concerns there. Um, really, really, really strong concerns. <laughs> Um, again, with the intervening COVID years, I, I'm not recalling all of them at this moment. You know, um, um, uh, uh, Councilmember Phil says uh, uh, statements just a moment ago uh, reminded me that really in any of these taxes, we're going to have uh, an additional issue, which is who's included and who's not. Yes, if I could just uh, go back and, and finish just okay. one moment, please. Um, what I was going to say connected to your prior uh, comment, Vice Mayor Burt, about um, not making exceptions. I think that will be an extremely difficult hill to climb and I would be willing to do it, but I think this committee would have to lead the way and um, be very strong. So that I, I, I think has- Can you a clarify what you're meaning? I, I... So, so perhaps I'm being too, um, too uh, obtuse. Um, the, the changes that council member Phil Seth was referring to that we went through last time, we had three tiers, you know, we were trying to worry about if you had three restaurants, were you a medium sized business when we really felt you were a small business, that kind of thing. Um, I think there were issues with veterans and a, a whole bunch of other things that we considered. Um, and I appreciate that that made it more complicated and that might, that we, there's a belief that that's one of the reasons the 2009 one failed, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So to the extent that we're gonna keep it simple, so that it's easy to understand and easy to administer, I think that's gonna be on, on the three of us to, you know, to, to, to carry that through. So I do think that's important um, if, if, we, if we return to headcount. Um, it's, by the way, it makes payroll super complicated because what's in payroll? How do you do the stock options? What if it's stock, et cetera, et cetera. Forget about stock options. Un, 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 uncalculable. Yeah. Okay. It's a balance um, sheet transaction anyway. All right. So I think I had the floor speaking to the motion and I think I'd asked something of the maker and now back to the preferences. So let me see.
see between the maker and staff who would who would like to go next? Because it looks like staff has put up A, B, and C here as a rank. It was just a suggestion if the maker and the um, seconder, well, frankly, if the committee is amenable to that. I think providing the council some guidance and benefit from this discussion would be good. So even if the committee's not ready to rule out a certain unit of measure, even helping through your motion to them to articulate the work that you've done tonight through this discussion on where the preferences lie is helpful. It also, in all honesty, helps give staff some um, focus over the coming few weeks on where we can get some more detail and brush up a little bit more on some of the restrictions so we can better address the conversation at the full council uh, instead of kind of trying to yeah. spray so across all. I, I think I heard that, um, uh, that that square footage was either uh, ranked first or tied for first amongst all three of us. Is that the case and therefore? It's that, yes. That's my that's that's yes. that's my impression too. Yeah, okay. I would be fine with that being listed first. Um, and then I think we're in a bit more of a toss up beyond that. So maybe we just put it that way, uh, as as of right now, uh, as our uh, our initial preference. I think that's helpful. So that's uh, yeah. I think if we hadn't had COVID, I would feel quite differently. Um, but you know, there's I think the uncertainty, and you know, if someone's only here two days a week, right? Is that two fifths of an employee? Yeah, Oof, I don't even want to think about that. Well, yeah, that's 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 how the employ that's how the um, that's one of the the ten thousand exemptions and adjustments you have to do for headcount. Yeah. You just do payroll. You know, I don't care. If they work for you, it doesn't matter where they work here or from home, okay? Give us 0.1% of their pay. <laughs> okay, all right. So staff's okay with A now and B. And then um, with C, was that basically sort of the work plan as it were? Okay, um, I do wanna say about the work plan, I feel that it's more robust than a time before that we saw. Um, I'm not quite sure. I mean, when we went through this two years ago, so kudos on that. Um, and then just with respect to affordable housing, um, this was referred to us. You have provided us with the information. Um, does, what does staff think would be helpful as this comes forward to council? Um, I mean, would this be part of a needs table and you could have, you know, sort of amounts per year? Do you need any more direction from us, I guess is what I'm really asking. I'm happy to weigh in there. Um, I think uh, you know, there's a number of items that were provided in terms of potential um, funding sources, some like the Cal CHA that would require um, relatively simple joining of an organization, but obviously talking about the, the trade-offs at the full council. Um, some were probably more just informational bond measures, things that I don't think have been picked up in this conversation. So going with what Ms. Nose was saying, if we were looking I, we heard that the Cal CHA was of interest. Impact fees obviously is coming forward. Um, and the uh, EFID was maybe of interest, but perhaps I'm not sure if that would be immediate or in the future. Um, and this is a long way of me stumbling to say if of those, if that's not correct, or if there were other items that were in the list of potential funding that the Finance Committee was wanting staff to look at and bring forward to the full council, that might be helpful if those weren't articulated today. Okay, did the maker have any additional things to add under affordable housing? No, I think that, would, you know, we have this other element of the impact fees, but that's already gonna come forward uh, next week. Um, I don't know if we, there's any need to allude to that here. Um, so I, I will say that uh, in discussions I had had with um, what's now Alto, but uh, uh, Palo Alto Housing, um, the uh, between the impact fee and what might be um, uh, you know five million a year or more from a business tax, they thought it might triple the rate of affordable housing in the city the way that they can leverage those dollars, and 
It wouldn't be a complete solution to our problems, but it would be a drastic transformation in what we can do. Um, I guess the only other thing that, that I had noted and certainly San Jose is looking at is the documentary transfer tax at a sort of super, super level. Um, is yeah, that I thought that was kind of interesting. I, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting too. Actually, the, uh, the luxury jumbo DTT was, uh, I thought that was interesting too. <laughs> um, I, I should have added one other thing when I was talking about what, what could uh, harm a ballot measure. And and that is having other taxes on the same ballot, uh, and especially local taxes. And so even if the DTT may be interesting, um, unless we're thinking that we do that instead of the business tax, I think that would be something we wouldn't want to consider uh, in the near term. Well, yeah, I, I, I understand that, especially if we we're going to do a, a utility tax at the same time too. We got to sort of get our head around that one. It's it's conceivable. I'm not saying we should do this, but we might consider sort of doing a package, <laughs> right? Saying, okay, this is this is the formula. It's got this, this, and this in it. Okay, and hope we can get people to to vote for the formula, the framework. Yeah, well, I am. Um, those are those are hard to do. Okay, so but uh, yeah. I appreciate the vice mayor's reasoning on this. I think it would be actually interesting though to know, you know, how much it might generate um, if we look back five years. Uh, obviously it's very difficult to predict these, project forecasts, these super large ones, but personally I'd be interested in having a little bit more information on that at the, at the large level, especially if you That's, think about the commercial. Okay, but instead of narrowing, we, that adds one more tax form to be studied. I thought we were trying to narrow. Uh, we did narrow. We narrowed pretty hard in A, but what I'm looking but at is But now you're D. adding back, right? Well, I'm looking at funding affordable housing. And well, this is one measure the that taxes, we've been asked to do. I mean, the taxes are about funding of different uses. And um, so it's A is not separate from D necessarily. So if you're, if you're now saying that you want to add back forms of tax, then I just don't think we've narrowed it. Then we that goes in the opposite direction. Uh, I'm still interested in having it, and if the makers is doing, you know, having staff spend a, two hours on it. So if the maker's not willing to do it, I can offer that as an amendment. How did you come up with two hours? I'm guessing. Okay. I, I'd be curious, at least on order of magnitude, right? I don't, not not That's necessarily really, down to the, the dollar, but is you know, are we looking at? One million a year, or ten million a year, or a hundred thousand a year, right? I mean, so exactly, yeah. order and, magnitude would be helpful. Well, but it sounds I, I like it, staff's writing it down, so perhaps it doesn't need to be yeah. in the motion. Uh, and and I think it 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 falls under A as a kind of a subset there uh, of tax forms yeah. as opposed yeah. to yeah. making an assumption. Use. You're making an assumption that the business tax will be used for affordable housing, and I, I don't think we're there. Yeah. Well, I'm saying what I'm saying is that A is really about forms of tax. And yeah, D no, is that's right. That's right. It's a tax, right? And D is about a use of a tax. A is a business tax. And I don't think that the documentary transfer tax is necessarily a business tax. Yeah. Well, that's right. true. It could be either commercial or residential. Or then, both. then call it E, but it's it's not <laughs> necessarily, there's nothing inherently linked between a DTT and affordable housing. Impact but, fees yeah. are more naturally linked. Uh, even I think the business acts. Uh, I, I'm okay with staff if it, they think they can evaluate in a couple hours. I have no problem with that. Um, I just don't want to imply that it is necessarily linked to the affordable housing. Does staff have any thoughts on how to move forward? Kylie, did you want to go in? I mean, I can relate to affordable housing, but I don't know if that's the main question. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, I'm not, uh, from a, a tax perspective, uh, it could be a DTT could be done as a general tax, obviously, which has a general use and, and doesn't necessarily have to have an access to affordable housing. I believe a DTT could also be done as a special tax. I would need to look into that a little bit further. 
Um, and at that point, it could be designated as a nexus to a certain um, aspect. It. I, I would I would be happy just knowing how many DTTable transactions a year there are over ten million dollars. Sure, and I think that's a data point we can easily provide. That's, that's up. Right. Okay, and that's I know a, that I, I'm. I'm, am I right that San Jose has done something similar and they're using it for affordable housing? We've received a fair more. amount of communication requesting that we consider doing the same, so. Okay, I'm done with my questions. Um, unless staff has any where, where did where, 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 where did Where did we leave uh, on A? Where did we actually leave payroll and headcount? Are they on or off or in limbo or? My understanding is that pay, there is no measure that is off the table. And okay. so, but there's a preference towards square footage um, with a second tier that the committee has discussed at the kind of payroll headcount. Okay. Swirling. Yeah, legality, and fe legality and feasibility of payroll was the one that I, that I, that I, that I, that, that, that I think I heard the vice mayor say that I think that, that I feel comfortable with too. So. Okay, I think we're ready to vote on the motion. Vice Mayor Burt. Yes. I will vote yes and Council Member Phil said. Yes. All right, that passes. We may, I'm sorry about that. I couldn't get Oops. my mute button quickly enough. We may have ask you to take one additional vote. Kylie, if you could. Uh, sure. Uh, I vote yes. <laughs> Hold on, careful, Council Member Phil said it's about <laughs> money. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I meant to say that. Do we need to figure out how to fund that? Um, yes, I've got that. Yeah. What would you like us to say? <laughs> That's the last piece that I might actually, um, as part of the motion, uh, uh, just, I don't know if this has to be as part of the motion, but at least a general acceptance and understanding from this committee and recommendation to Council that uh, staff bring back the resource needs in order to do this. So that means the analysis staffing, the stakeholder outreach, the polling, and uh, at a certain point, the, the legal aspect of this, um, which okay. uh, last time I wanna say our costs, if we had executed to full, not including the legal, just the first three, our costs were over 250,000. And we'll have to raise taxes for that. We have a $750,000 reserve that uh, the committee very intelligently set aside as part of the 2022 budget process in anticipation of this. Oh, you set uh, it aside and we asked you what it was for. Okay, works, so works, works for me. just to move forward on that, um, should that be a, a, a separate E uh, that is uh, because C looks like it, it refers to um, more the tax measure versus the staff uh, or the resources needed to pursue what we're doing above. I think actually correct? under C, you could say, and uh, bring forward the resources necessary to. The like budget this. action is necessary to fund. Yeah. Ms. Stump, do we need to officially reconsider this motion or by acclamation, you can agree? All right, I we agree. don't, okay. I agree. Do I do as well. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Now we're now we're done with action item two. Thanks everyone. Um, you know, I, I feel like we're 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 looping here, but um, hopefully we'll uh, we'll end up um, crossing the finish line next year. All right, that brings us to future meetings and agendas. Am I right that we are next meeting in August? That is correct. All right. Chair. So I hope that all of our uh, staff enjoys their July and anything else to add before we adjourn Miss Nose. Which uh, is the first meeting date in August? August 17th. So that is actually the date I did want to point to. Uh, the council returns from break uh, the week of the 9th, which would be the second Tuesday. So PNS is scheduled for that 10th. Um, and so finance committee would be on the 17th of August. Council's returning on a Tuesday. The, no. no, the 9th. The 9th okay. is a Monday. Sorry. Right. Okay. So the 17th, August 17th will be our next meeting. Yes. All right. With that, we're adjourned. Everyone have a great summer. Thank, Thank you. You too.